All right, everyone, if we could uh, kind of get seated, we'll get things started. Um, good morning. I would like to call to order a meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Today is September 17th, 2024, and the time is 933. Uh, I would like to call on Pastor Kyle Strom from Ocean Church for the invocation. Welcome, Pastor. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a, an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, I just want to remind us, it says in Psalms 118, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for a day of sunshine. Lord, we, we thank you for the five senses that we can smell and taste, and we can uh, soak in this awesome Florida sun. Lord, we pray for this meeting right now, Lord. We pray for the decisions that are going to be made. Lord, we thank you for the leaders that you have pointed uh, for our city, for our county. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, the decisions that are going to be made today, that you would give them wisdom, uh, discernment in those. Lord, we, we are so grateful that uh, you are a part of everything that we do. You're the center of everything that we do. So, Lord, now, be in this meeting. We love you so much. In your great and mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Kyle. Uh, before we begin the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like, to, uh, uh, I would like us to remain standing and I will ask for a moment of silence for Rick and Angelicus, who passed away on September the 4th. He was a past president of Lehigh Acres Community Council and an advocate for youth sports. We will be, he, he, will, he will be missed. Our thoughts are with his wife, Ruth, and his family. So please uh, join me in a moment of silence. Okay, please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, please be seated. Okay, we have four cere ceremony presentation this morning. I would like to recognize Commissioner Pendergrass for the first presentation. Thank you, Chairman. If I could, uh, if the animal services come forward, we have a special guest in the house this morning. We have Victor here, and he's uh, brought up with Sue and Karen. If you could, he's a short one though. He's a low rider. So, uh, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> he, uh, Victor's looking for a home. He's adorable, as you can tell with the picture in the office, and you see here the. He's a really well-behaved dog, and Karen, you got you got some programs coming up this week. Or some yes. Saturday, you have an event. Definitely, it is Adopt a Less Adoptable Pet Week, which is nationally recognized. And Victor actually hits three categories in that, believe it or not, um, because one, he's a bully breed, which is considered less adoptable. Um, we don't consider it that way, obviously, because he's adorable. He's also mostly black, which is also considered in that category. And he's a senior, but don't tell him that because he does not know that. He walked up the stairs quicker than we did. Um, he is seven years old. So Friday and Saturday, we're celebrating by having waived adoption fees. So come on out. We have um, quite a few senior pets, um, obviously a lot of bully breeds. And, you know, black is a popular color around our place, and it matches everything. So come on out and celebrate with us. And don't wait till Friday or Saturday for Victor because somebody's going to, you know, swoop him up because he's been great today. So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you, Sue, for coming down today, too. And Victor, I hope you get a good home. He's sitting there staring at Dave or, uh, Dave or uh, Lynn there for a second. <laughs> Dave won't look at him, though. <laughs> Dave's not paying attention. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for coming down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Wayne, would you like to present the next proclamation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm here speaking on false prevention awareness. Anyone from that group? Come on up, please. Thank you. I'll read the proclamation. We'll take a photo and then obviously someone that would like to say a few words. Okay. Whereas over 27% of Southwest Florida residents are over 65 years. And whereas falls are a leading cause of fetal and non-fetal injuries among Florida's senior population, resulting in significant physical, personal, social, and economic burdens. Where is it estimated that the annual, there are more than 150,000 hospital-treated injuries from falls from 30 and 65 and older with medical charges exceeding $2 billion. 
And whereas among Floridians 65 and older, falls account for more than 75% of all fractured treated in the emergency departments. And whereas falling and the fear of falling can lead to depression, loss of mobility, loss of functionality, independence. And whereas injuries from falls are preventable community health problem. And whereas falls prevention education is critical first step in increasing public awareness uh, regarding elderly fall prevention and home safety. And whereas cost effective home modification and community strategies are available to improve safety and lessen the likelihood of falls and deliberating injuries that result from, and whereas implementing elderly fall prevention strategies is an effective tool for reducing the stress associated with providing caregivers services. And whereas the Florida Department of Elderly Affairs Community for a Lifetime, the Florida Department of Health, Office of Injury Prevention, Florida Statewide Prevention Coalition, and statewide agencies on aging, in partnership with Florida communities and residents, are working in to increase awareness of this issue and encourage Flor Floridians uh, to take steps to protect those who are at risk of falling. Now, therefore, it's been resolved by the Board of County Commissioners on September 22nd, 2024, as National Falls Prevention Awareness Day in Lee County. It's signed by our chairman, Mike Greenlaw. Thank you. Thank you. We have Kaylee, one of our wonderful advanced providers, who would like to say a few words. I would just like to thank everyone, the community, for their support. Um, I was a first responder myself before I became a PA, so huge respect, huge admiration to all the first responders who protect and serve our community every day, help make our job possible. Thank you guys for what you do day in and day out. And on the hospital side of things, it takes a lot of people to come together and provide care and work together to keep all of our patients safe and provide them the best care possible. So just thank you everyone for everything you do every day and thank you to the community for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hammond, will you present the third proclamation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to invite everybody from the Harry Chapin Food Bank and anyone else who is here for the Hunger Action Month to please come stand at the podium. I'd like to read this resolution into the record. Good morning, how you doing? Morning, Brian. How good, are you? good, glad you're here. Thank you for joining us today. I'll read the uh, resolution into the record and then we'll have, a, have you come up and take a picture and then after that, we'd love to have you say a few words. Okay, so the resolution reads as follows. I'm getting old, so I gotta use these now. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas 44 million people in the United States are considered food insecure or lacking consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy lifestyle. Whereas more than 13 million children and nearly 7 million seniors in the United States experienced hunger. Whereas food insecurity can affect people from all walks of life, with millions of Americans being just one job loss, missed paycheck, or medical emergency away from hunger. Whereas limited access to health and nutritious food can have a long-standing effect on individuals, especially children, such as negatively impacting health, development, and well-being, leading to increased medical issues, poor academic performance, and delayed developmental milestones. And whereas Hunger Action Month is observed each September seeks to raise awareness about hunger in America, and whereas Hunger Action Month seeks to inspire action by calling on individuals to do their part to end hunger in their communities, Whereas the Harry Chapin Food Bank is the largest hunger relief organization and only Feeding America part and the only Feeding America partner in Southwest Florida, serving Collier, Lee, Charlotte, Glades, and Henry counties, and whereas Harry Chapin Food Bank is steadfastly committed to ending hunger in Southwest Florida, whereas Harry Chapin Food Bank serves approximately 250,000 children, families, and seniors a month in need through a variety of innovative programs and partnerships aimed at ensuring everyone has reliable access to healthy and nutritious food. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Lee County, Florida, does hereby recognize September 2024 as Hunger Action Month in Lee County, and we encourage everyone to take a part in ending hunger. It's duly executed this 17th day by our chairman, Mike Greenwell. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Thank you. And Richard, please say a few words. 
So thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate the proclamation, appreciate the recognition of the issue of hunger, appreciate the support for Harry Chapin Food Bank. Um, as you know, I'm Richard LeBur, I'm president and CEO of the Food Bank. Um, it may be hard for some people to understand, looking around the obvious uh, affluence and success of Lee County, that there are hungry people among our, amongst us. Uh, many of them are working families, some are seniors on fixed incomes, um, some are veterans, a variety of different walks of life. I'm, I'm sorry to say that hunger in our community is up. The Harry Chapin Food Bank is distributing about 80% more food now than it did before the pandemic. Uh, the latest statistics on food insecurity show a significant increase nationwide, but also in our community. There are about 100,000 food insecure people in Lee County. So that's about one in eight residents in Lee County will go hungry at some point this year. Um, there's a variety of causes for that. Primarily it's economic. Uh, as we all know, we've had a significant bout of inflation. I would point out in particular that uh, rents in our community have gone way up in the last several years. I commend the commissioners for the actions you have taken to encourage uh, addition of uh, uh, affordable workforce housing. But I would also have to comment that more is needed. Um, the Harry Chapin Food Bank is working very hard in our response to do this and we're dealing not only with an increase in uh, hunger but also with uh, some decreased funding. Uh, there were a lot of special funding programs during the pandemic and following the hurricane which have lapsed and so we find ourselves with increased demand and decreased resources. Uh, we are taking action to support that. We continue to support uh, 20 direct distributions to uh, hungry people throughout our community every single month. Uh, we have 20 pantries in Lee County schools open and operating to serve families in those schools that need help and we provide completely free food to about 90 other organizations, pretty much every major organization in Southwest Florida in Lee County that is serving the hungry gets a substantial portion of their food from us. So uh, we thank you again for the support. We thank the community for its steadfast support for our work and for the many thousands of volunteers who come out every year to help us do what we do. And from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all the hungry people that we and our partner agencies serve, I thank the commissioners for this recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the last ceremonial will be presented by Commissioner Roney. Thank you. <coughs> Mindy Simon here. Come on up, Mindy. Anybody from the library? Come on up, please. Notice how much quieter they are when they come in here than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so it must be a library thing. Or it's a library thing. Great. Proclamation reads as follows: Whereas Lee County Library System, established by the Board of County Commissioners, September 23rd, 1964, celebrating 60 years as community centers for our residents, providing most limited opportunities education, employment, entrepreneurship, and engagement. And whereas a library card and the use of local facilities enriches our lives and understanding of the world through the connection between the community, its people, its resources, and whereas the Lee County Library System provides materials and resources both in libraries and online across an access of programming, computers and gathering spaces of which people learn, discover, evaluate, and use information for their jobs, education, health, and recreation and whereas librarians and library staff continue to look to the future for what libraries can do for the residents of Lee County, supporting the growth and development in Lee County, improving access to resources and services, and whereas the library card is the key to opening the world of information, literacy, and opportunity for all people of all ages. Now, therefore, it's been resolved that the Board of County Commissioners in Lee County does hereby celebrate Lee County Library System's 60th anniversary, and we invite and encourage all Lee County citizens to visit Lee County Library Systems and obtain a free library card. It's duly executed by our Chairman, Mike Greenwell, the 17th, September 2024. Congratulations. Congratulations.
Tighten up. Tighten up. There we go. All right. All right. One, two, and three. One more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for recognizing the Lee County Library System reaching this milestone anniversary. 60 years of being a library system and acknowledging the value of having a library card. On September 23, 1964, the Lee County Board of County Commissioners voted to establish, operate, and maintain a countywide tax-supported free library system. In the 60 years since, the Lee County Library System has grown to include 13 libraries, outreach and mobile services, telephone and virtual reference, home borrower services, and a variety of online services and resources. We appreciate the continued support of the commissioners, county management, staff, and the community. Our library staff is incredible, and we are all proud of the services the Lee County Library System provides to the residents, employees, and visitors of Lee County. Our libraries provide the spaces, resources, programs, and excellent customer service to meet the needs of those we serve. Here's to many more years of Lee County Libraries positively impacting our community. Thank you for your recognition and support, and I also encourage everyone to visit our libraries and get a library card. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes the ceremonials. At this time, we will take up the recap. Uh, there are no items to defer. We have one correction. The administrative agenda on, online has item one as accounting manager merit and item two as the award uh, CDBGDR funds for affordable housing development. Therefore, we will take those item up, items up in that order. Okay. Uh, at this time, we will take up the consent agenda. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, uh, Commissioner Pendergrass, do you have any items to pull? None. Okay. Commissioner Hammond, any items to pull? None. Commissioner Sandelli, any items to pull? None. Commissioner Wayne? No. And I have none. Um, so at this time, I do have a, a few comment cards of our shelves. Good morning, um, Marcia Ellis for the record. Um, I'm going to speak on a number of items. I'm gonna start with number five, which is the alternative uh, funding for Kingston. I stand in opposition for that. I think that the uh, dist U.S. District Court has spoken loud and clear regarding concerns for the endangered species. Um, I'll also reserve on the land development code to review those in more detail. Uh, in terms of the acquisition for the Alico Road, um, I've put in pages and pages of comments with concerns for that as well, um, this, as well as with uh, item number 17, the CDB DGR multi uh, rehab. But I want to focus the bulk of my time on item number 42, which is to retain legal counsel for uh, solid waste. Um, I became aware of concerns with the incinerator after a dioxin furon exceedance required a consent order and a fine to be paid um, following Hurricane Ian. Um, the community was entirely unaware that dioxin, the world's most dangerous chemical, was being spewed into their community um, uh, following that exceedance, which continued on for at least uh, a known six months. Um, 
At this time, uh, there's a hearing going on over on the East Coast where communities are fighting the addition of another incinerator after the Covanta plant over there burned down after three weeks of being on fire. Um, and uh, many, many organizations have had taken a stance against further incinerators in the state of Florida, including Sierra Club and many other partners. There is an extensive um, a series of alliances that have formed up, and I personally have devoted about 30% of my time working on the issue of incineration, understanding the nuances, and forming allegiances, taking trainings online and other to get to know this issue intimately to defend my, my community against the continuation of the permit at Buckingham in the addition of any other incineration north of the river. Let me be clear, bad planning led to a community park being built next to the incinerator. I personally taught for over 10 years in the affected community of, uh, in uh, proximity to this incinerator. We do not need to be accommodating Babcock Ranch, which claims sustainability by tabbing millions and millions of a, uh, square feet of commercial and taking their solid waste. Please, you are charged with protecting the health and the protecting our community, including our environmentally sensitive receivers from this contamination. 100% of the communities, according to uh, European studies, have been impacted by dioxin. Dioxin bone binds to proteins, it accumulates in chicken eggs, it accumulates in meats. Thank you. Please stand to protect your community, our food, our independence, our children, and our environment from this threat. Thank you. All right, please, please no clapping. All right, thank you, Ms. Ellis. Um, all right, at this time, William Schottenmiller. William here? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning I noticed uh, some surplus of property uh, being available uh, River Road, North Fort Myers, and uh, uh, property in Lehigh that has been uh, taken because of drug activity and that made, uh, made available. And I think uh, with the housing thing that, uh, that uh, some form of uh, not just residential for one, but for multiple until other housing is built would be good for some of this property that you have surplus. Uh, as always, uh, you know, the uh, new law that's going to become effect. I was at the uh, uh, council meeting yesterday, and everybody's saying, what are we going to do uh, to house people? Well, we need affordability. We need emergency housing until other housing can be built and, and affordable, like a youth hostel setting, something. Salvation Army years ago had uh, a good solution. It was $8 a day, you did day labor, and uh, you, know, you got some need. Well, we need to get something like that going. So we have people sheltered and they're contributing. I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, I think that's all the comment cards I have on that. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on the consent agenda at this time? Okay, the, seeing none, I will close public comment. Do I have a motion? I move the balance. Okay, we have I'll motion. second it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Pendergrass, second from Commissioner Hammond. Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda? Nope. Any objections? Seeing none, consent agenda approves unanimously. Uh, that concludes the set agenda. We will move to administrative uh, agenda. Uh, Richard, please introduce item one on the administrative agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It will be my pleasure. Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, item one is pursuant to your employment agreement that you have with the county manager. As you recall from the most recent discussion with regard to the hearing officer, similar in nature to her contract, uh, Mr. Harner has a provision in his contract that annually based on the evaluations that you have all performed individually that are now public record, he is entitled to consideration of a merit increase, uh, the range being between four and 6%. It is at the board's discretion. Okay. Okay, so commissioners, we have any questions or comments for staff at this time? 
I move the item of approval with a 6% increase. Second. Okay, we have approval with 6% increase from Commissioner Pendergrass, a second from Commissioner Wayne. Um, okay, I will call for public comment on item one. Does anyone wish to speak on item one? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Pendergrass with a 6% increase is the motion and a second from Commissioner Wayne. Are there any further discussion? Chair, I would, love to, Hammond. I would love to just take a moment to publicly show my appreciation for the job that uh, Dave Harner's done over the last year. I mean, he came in following uh, Roger who had been here for 10 years. I mean, that's gotta be a tough act to follow. And this first year has been really well, you know, really well, really, really well received, if I can say that. Um, but, you know, we all gave him wonderful evaluations, and uh, I can tell you it, it has not been an easy first year, but um, I appreciate your leadership throughout this first year and the job that you're doing and the way you communicate with the board and work with us, and so thank you very much for that. I would like to agree. Uh, like Mr. Commissioner Hammond said, thank you, Dave, for your, what, 34 years of service now for Lee County and everything you've done the last year, and we look forward to working with you another year. Um, you've got a great team behind you here sitting here next to you and all the hundreds of county, thousands of county employees that work for you every day. So, again, thank you for, for the service you provide to us, residents of Lee County. Commissioner Sandell. I, I agree, and I think that uh, what I've seen is as you continue to put your team together, um, what we're doing now is sustainable going forward in the future. And that means a great deal for the community long term. Thank you. Commissioner Wayne. I just want to personally thank you for the job you walked into. I uh, appreciate everything you've done, putting everybody together, and I look forward to working with you. Uh, Mr. Harner, I don't think people realize that you touch almost every decision and uh, that is, is, or every issue we have in the county. Um, you have a tough job, um, and I'm amazed at. Uh, you have a wonderful staff behind you, and that's what it takes, and uh, successful people surround themselves with successful people, and you're doing a great job, and I appreciate everything you do every day. Um, so we have a motion to approve. Any objections? No. No objections? Item one moves unanimously. Five to zero. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harner, please introduce item number two. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, I'd like to thank all of you um, for your support and uh, leadership. It's, uh, it's been a privilege to, to uh, be in this position. I'd also uh, like to, um, to acknowledge senior team, the county attorney's office and all their support, and as well as, as the staff in general, the, the great job that they do um, every day. So again, thank you for um, letting me have this position and do this great work with these great people. So thank you very much. Uh, item number two is to award CDBGDR funds for affordable housing development. I'd like to ask Ms. Jeannie Sutton to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. This item awards approximately $89 million in CDBGDR funds for the development of new affordable housing units. These recommendations were made by the CDBGDR Affordable Housing Development Committee um, which met on September 9th and reviewed and discussed all submitted applications. We received eight applications in response to the notice of funding availability for single family housing development. Six of these applications were determined to be eligible and five are being recommended by the evaluation committee for funding. If awarded, these, this award will provide $50 million to Habitat for Humanity for the completion of five new housing developments for single family housing producing approximately 262 new housing units for income qualified home buyers. In addition, the multifamily housing development NOFA uh, received approximately 61 applications requesting more than a billion dollars in CWGDR funding. The evaluation committee reviewed all of those applications and voted to recommend three projects for immediate award. Those projects were Bayshore Pines, Hermosa II, and Ecos on Evans. These projects indicated that they had closing dates for um, other funding sources before the end of the year, and therefore are being recommended at this moment for funding. The committee also voted to have another committee meeting to hear presentations from other selected applicants. Um, that meeting will occur on 10-7, at which we anticipate the evaluation committee will make additional recommendations, which will also be brought back to you for consideration. Okay, all right, thank you. Does any commissioner have anything for staff? Right any public comments? Uh, 
You mean public? Yes, we have public. Okay, great. Yes. Um, nothing. All right. At this time, I will take up public comment on item two. Um, first person up is Brian so Soldry on item two. Up after that will be Billy Joe Bransfield. Good morning, County Commissioners. My name is Brian Sodre. I'm a general contractor and owner of Minneapolis. We're dedicated to building affordable housing, and the way we do that is by reducing the living square footage. This allows us to build quality homes at affordable rates. Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. And today, we, I want to talk about what happened on September 9th with the evaluation committee that deemed us ineligible. They deemed us ineligible due to a lack of experience in affordable housing development and managing government grants. I'm here to share with you, despite these concerns, why we're qualified. If there was more affordable housing developers, we wouldn't be in an affordable housing crisis. If Habitat for Humanity wasn't the primary recipient to most single family housing grants, we would have a resume to show for managing those grants. What does Minneapolis offer? A youthful perspective, zealous advocacy, drive and ambition, and strong collaborations, such as developers, general contractors, specialty tradesmen, grant management, HUD housing consultants, and leaders within Lee County. All of us collectively can and are eligible to assume the responsibility of building affordable housing in the single family sector. We're not asking for special treatment. We're simply saying, open up the playing field. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bransfield, and after that will be Savannah Miller-Berg. Dear commissioners, I hope this letter finds you well. My name is Billy Joe, and I'm the owner of Permit E Solutions located in Lehigh Acres. I'm here today to address the issue of affordable housing in Lee County. As a small business owner and a single mom in Lee County, I've witnessed firsthand the challenges and opportunities facing our community. I help contractors pull permits and go through the permitting process. I'm here today to request a grant be kept locally in our community. Housing is unaffordable for the average person today. We have an amazing company, Minneapolis, willing to give this to the community by the help of this grant. This would be able to help any single mom or any family in our area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Santa Ana. All right, next after that will be Nicole. Mikhail. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Savannah Millerberg, and I'm with Community Housing and Resources on Sanibel Island. And we applied for the CDBG DR multifamily housing application. And we were given another chance um, to present at the October 7th meeting. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that Community Housing and Resources has been a nonprofit organization that provides affordable housing to the workforce and seniors on the islands that were greatly devastated by Hurricane Ian. Um, and we've been around for 45 years and we build in perpetuity and so we're committed to providing affordable housing um, for a very long time. We've identified it a 6.7 acre lot on Sanibel which is very hard to find these days um, and we've been working with the Deputy Director of Planning for our application. He's been able to review it, look over it and we are following all of the guidelines with the city. Um, we have the full support of the city of Sanibel, and we have financial backing from multiple banks, and so we are shovel ready and ready to break ground. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Nicole McHale, is that right? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. McHale's Navy. I got it. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Nicole McHale. I am the Executive Director of Community Housing and Resources, located on Sanibel and Captiva. We have been incorporated for 45 years. We are the only applicants that have applied for the CDBG DR Disaster Relief Grant. We're the only ones that were impacted that have applied for this grant. We appreciate the opportunity to come back in October um, to present our project. As Savannah told you, we identified 6.7 acres of land that we can build 20 units, but this land is gonna afford us the opportunity to build more housing on Sanibel. We are shovel ready. We have the support of the city of Sanibel. And we are at a critical time in our community. We have working homeless individuals. 20% of uh, the um, residents out on Sanibel are low to moderate income individuals. It's mind blowing, I know, but it's true because you don't drive down those streets. But we are, uh, and we service Lee County. We might be located on Sanibel, but we service Lee County. We are not housing individuals that live on Sanibel. We are housing individuals that are in Lee County. Um, we are project, uh, we are duplicating, uh, we are already building this building off of Periwinkle and we are gonna duplicate this building on that land. And I just wanna thank you because our organization has been primarily funded by grants given to us from Lee County. So we appreciate the support, we appreciate your time and your effort that you put into the community and making it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, up next will be Erica uh, Steiner. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you for a few minutes this morning. I'm Erica Steiner. I'm the Vice President of Community Housing and Resources. I'm also a um, planning commissioner um, at, in, on Sanibel Island. Um, so underscoring that this is a CDBG DR disaster relief, I just wanted to share a little bit of personal information with you. A disaster relief on Sanibel is so meaningful. Our islands were devastated. And on a personal note, I'm one of the unfortunate people who lost their home, lost all their belongings. But in some respects, I am fortunate because I am rebuilding and I, I can rebuild. Our residents are not as fortunate as I am. They are essential workers. They don't have a lot of choices for housing. We provide in perpetuity affordable housing. We are a not-for-profit. Not not we um, raise funds. As Nicole said, we are super grateful for all of the help that we've gotten from Lee County, but we need more help. And we don't have enough housing to support all the people that can come there and have jobs. So we're not, we're not just supporting housing, we're also supporting um, jobs. And we thank you for the opportunity to talk again on October 7th and um, look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dan Obersky. If I mispronounced that, please correct. Good enough. Hi, Dan Obersky. Um, I'm gonna read, I'm surprisingly nervous in front of all of you. Um, good morning, I am speaking as a citizen, but one with specific knowledge and education around real estate. I'm grateful, excited, and encouraged by the efforts and intentionality of staff to carry the, this process through. Majority of your funding approval today is going to Habitat, and this uh, produces ownership and taxpayers. Though I would love to see more organizations being stood up to affect change in our market, I can't say one negative word about Ms. Lucas and the organization she leads. On the multifamily side, I am so impressed by the intentionality and detail that has got us to this point. I have just a couple of asks. For the first three approvals, they each made a commitment to close and begin their project by the year end. And I would hope that you would force this commitment to execute. And if unable to execute, reallocate those funds. Uh, I additionally have sent to all of you um, what I would call just a filtering lens to ask some deeper questions on the readiness um, of the projects that will be presented uh, going forward um, to push into transparency the definition of shovel ready 
is somewhat um, divided or undefined. Um, and so asking for clarity around those items, especially in the realm of water management um, and site approvals. Um, asking for funding clarity. This is a capital stack that is extremely complicated and making sure that they have full knowledge and understanding of how they will resource the capital and obtain approvals so that the projects can proceed forward. The third item is around community confidence and staff confidence. You have an incredible staff as referenced and led by your county manager. Um, they know what they are talking about. They have executed and continue to execute on permits and approvals. And I would ask that you trust them in honoring uh, their understanding of who they can work with, who will work with them. All of these development projects are extremely nuanced and they never have all uh, knowledge up front. You get into a project and things change. And so your staff confidence I think is critical. Um, so I would ask that you really consider their, rec uh, their recognition and work with those uh, developers that they've worked with in the past. My last comment and request is notifying or reminding you that these developers that you approve will be representative of you before HUD and a tremendous amount of funding. So I ask you to consider their character, their representation, and what they have done in the past and how it will carry your names forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Michael Allen. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, Michael Allen, Revital Development Group. Um, here today as uh, one of the applicants in the CDBG DR multifamily round. Um, first, I want to just start off by recognizing staff, the commissioners, and the evaluation <coughs> committee. You guys have done a phenomenal job, staff, especially on, over the past couple of years as well. Um, and then the support you guys have all done for affordable housing over the past several years leading up to it as well. Uh, can't thank you enough, so it's very important for, for what we and all the other developers look to do. Um, we are fortunate to be one of the, uh, one of the three recommended applicants for today's funding request, uh, Hermosa North Fort Myers. It's a second phase of a project we look to start at by the end of the year. The first phase we look to start uh, that's not affiliated with this round um, within the next 30 days or so. So we're excited about that and bringing housing to, to Lee County. That will be the first um, new construction affordable project in unincorporated Lee County in over 20 years. So uh, appreciate the support there as well. I'm very proud of that. Um, when staff went through with their recommendations, they sorted the eligible applications 80 points or above and did several tiers. Um, three today were in tier one. There was eight in total. Uh, I'm coming to you today to respectfully uh, request consideration of adding three additional applications for funding. That would be um, ours and then Southward Village City of Fort Myers that we're not affiliated with, but um, just highly experienced local commitment, knowledge of the process. I know the second round of uh, evaluation was put off for another three to four weeks or so, but just asking to get a head start just because of the, the, the significant need for that as well for some consideration um, in today as well. Um, on our project at Senior uh, that I mentioned, it's Ava Square in uh, Cape Coral with a preference for veterans. Um, it was a sixth highest two score average application. Um, we're gonna be providing not only uh, recovery efforts, but also future mitigation as well. Uh, within the action plan, it does state that some multifamily projects, even built and completed in 2021, although not damaged, the residents were displaced due to long-term power outages. So ours, for example, for seniors, we're gonna incorporate generators as well as solar component to, to have that, to, to mitigate those, those risks and displacements in the future. Uh, for me, it's important. My mother's a resident in Cape Coral. She was displaced for about six months as a result of Hurricane um, Ian. Also, the stresses involved, we're very well aware of that. and. and um, some trauma causing some con cognitive decline and other mental issues as well to the residents. So, so projects such as this, I think, are, are severely uh, needed and important. A um, little bit again about Revital, as some of you may know, um, we're opening the first workforce and affordable community in Cape Coral uh, any day now within the next couple of weeks, either by the end of the month or early October, once we uh, go through the final closeout schedule with the city of Cape Coral. Um, and we've developed over 1,900 multifamily projects here in Lee County and couldn't do it without the great support of you guys, the commissioners, and, and, and the staff along the way. So sincerely grateful for that. Thank you very Thank much. You, Michael. Uh, Sean uh, Moshiam and Oscar Paul, I believe, will be next. If I mispronounce that, please correct me, sir, when you come up. No. Uh, Oscar Paul, development manager for National Community Renaissance, uh, also known as National Core. National Core is the nation's third largest nonprofit affordable housing developer in the country. We've developed and own over 100 properties, 
over 10,000 units. Uh, again, just like everybody else here, uh, I want to echo the efforts of staff in putting together the HUD action plan and getting the CDBGDR funds allocated to Lee County. The purpose of those funds is to be deployed quickly and effectively to develop affordable housing for the most vulnerable populations here in Lee County, the wake of disaster Hurricane Ian. My development, uh, Oak Park, is a 144 unit development for our low income seniors. It's located in District 4, near the intersection of Ortiz and East Michigan Avenue. Uh, it's fully built out with amenities, including a pickleball court, a pool, barbecue pavilion, community garden, fitness center, cyber cafe, uh, as our current plans sit. Those current plans are permit ready. We have a permit issuance letter from the building department and are essentially ready to go. The last piece of the puzzle would be the CDBG DR funds. Uh, with a request of $6.75 million and a total development cost of $42.6 million, uh, we are extremely leveraged on that CDBG award. With that award, if granted today, uh, we would be able to start construction this year and close uh, early December. It's important to note that we received a score of 92 out of 100 and we're also a tier one application. At the CDBGDR Review Committee, hosted on the 9th of this month, uh, and you'll see in your agenda, uh, it was decided to fund those three developments that have a need to close on the funds prior to the end of this year. Uh, after being left off from the three uh, recommendations that were brought to you today, we asked staff why we were uh, excluded. We were told that in our application, we stated a 1031, October 31st closing date, and because of this, we would not be recommended as the required HUD environmental review would extend beyond that date. That is simply false. Nowhere in our application do we mention a closing date or the month of October anywhere. What we do say is that if the environmental review and the CDBG award is finalized by November, then we will be able to close the first week of December and commence construction this year, 2024, quickly develop quickly develop and deliver affordable housing to your residents. With my time ending, I thank you. I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Sean, here to finish up our points. Good morning, commissioners. Pause <clears throat> here. You are, Sean, please say your name. Yes, sir. Sean Mosheim with National Corps. Okay, I'm not sure you spoke first. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Did it, you Michael Allen? No, that was no, Oscar, Oscar Paul. Paul. Right. Oscar Paul. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't get your name in. All right. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, yeah, Commissioners. Head backwards is why. Thank you. No yes, problem. sir. Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> to echo my colleague Oscar's sentiment, um, we're really unsure how an October 31st closing deadline was brought about. There's actually no deadline to have a financial closing. The only deadline that we're up against is to get a firm loan commitment from Florida Housing Finance Corporation. As Oscar mentioned, we were placed in the tier one category. There were only seven developments out of 61 that applied that were placed in a tier one category. We received a score of 92. We have all of our permits in place. We have all of our financial commitments in place. We, again, we don't have a deadline to close by October. All that we need to do is get a firm loan commitment from Florida Housing Finance Corporation. And in order to do that, we need a positive funding recommendation from the county of the CDGB award. We have all the same financial closing timelines as the three developments that were recommended for funding. And in fact, there's enough funds to fund all tier one applicants. So rather than delay the process and not hit our deadline by getting the CDGB award now for immediate recommendation, we kindly ask you all to please administratively approve our development in order to receive our firm loan commitment from Florida Housing so that we're able to meet our deadline with them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, up next is uh, Jacqueline, Jack Jacqueline McMiller and Marshallis will be next. After. 
Good morning, um, commissioners. I'd like to thank everyone for giving us the opportunity to come and speak on this very, very important subject. I am here because I'm a representative of War II in the city of Fort Myers. The city of Fort Myers is one of the most um, low to moderate areas in, in Lee County, even though it's located within the city. Now, $50 million was given to, was awarded to one company, Habitat for Humanity. Um, as we've seen with many of the developers that have stood here, um, many of the tier ones and others um, that have applied for the CDBG grant, um, they were overlooked. And I think that that's something that needs to be re-evaluated. I think that um, the evaluation board has done a wonderful job. Um, nothing against them, but I think that there's a lot of things that have been missed, which I will share with you. My concern with Habitat for Humanity, I think that they've done a wonderful job for applying and, and being able to provide for low-income housing. However, there's some concern as to their ability to ensure that this is a sustainable housing community. Um, in 2013, there was concern as to they were selling homes for $224,000, which many of the homes, it only took about $105,000 to build. Out of um, 1,274 Habitat home buyers, only 118 families have been able to pay off their mortgages. The rest have been foreclosed on. So that's really concerning. We're looking at sustainability for where they're going to sell these homes at an affordable rate where they can sustain at least a category three hurricane. So these are some things that are concerning. We need to start looking at other housing opportunities even smaller homes. I know that there was a mention of some of the mini homes. These are affordable housing that is available and you have developers that are here to be able to build these homes and provide the affordable housing that is necessary. On behalf of the city of Fort Myers, myself, especially in War II, which is the most economic um, dependent people in the area, we need to look back and take a look at what the decisions that have been made thus far. I thank you for your time and I will give my time over to Marcia Ellis. Thank you. Good morning, Marcia Ellis for the record. Um, so the CDBDGR funding and, um, and uh, that is being awarded um, looks like it is heavily leaning on some models that we've already had in this community. And so with the, the vast number of, of, of families, of older folks in the area um, that are experiencing housing burden, and that would be everybody that is paying more than 30% um, of their, their income, right? Everybody who's paying more than 30% is a vast group of folks in this community. So. We need to start thinking about numbers. How can we increase the number of units exponentially to match the exponential acceleration of the crisis? And while the dream of home ownership that Habitat for Humanity has fulfilled for many families in this community, at least 180 who have successfully been able to hold on to it, it, it doesn't near touch the amount of need. We're talking single family homes. Single family homes require, we're not, we're not sure of the amount of insurance. I think we need to start looking at the insurance analysis for the types of insurance that are required for affordable housing. Because if, if, you're, if you're gonna need flood insurance because of where your place is located, that, that doesn't make it affordable anymore, does it? And when we think about the benefits that we get from some uh, speeding up the structures, like the mini homes, if they're resilient homes built of better materials um, uh, that can consolidate some, some am common amenities, then that is a benefit for the community. If we can deploy uh, people out at where the work is uh, using a different model, then we should certainly look at that because the crisis is enormous. This isn't going to be fixed by holding on to some old dreams that people in the community have struggled to keep going for a considerable amount of time. We're looking for durable reductions in housing burden for this community over time. 
and I support the, uh, the, the developers who are dedicated to this sector, um, and I recognize the threats that uh, recapture has, the conversion of affordable housing units to market rate, and I again um, urge you to to re-examine the, the, the models that we have in place, but, but look forward and help us solve this crisis, recognizing how significant it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bruce Strayhorn, uh, do you wish to speak on item two, sir? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my pleasure to be here. I appear here today as chairman of the Fort Myers Housing Authority, established in 1960, that serves over 15,000 residents that are largely 70% or less than AMI. I want to thank you for item 17, because in year 17, most of the developers have been talking about new construction. The one in 17 are to fix the roofs at Renaissance, to fix the roofs at East Point to fix the roofs at East Point Landing, where the mold is, where it's happening now. Nothing critical about any of these other applicants, but your staff, I think, correctly identified these folks need something now. So this is a thank you for chairman and members of the board. I don't uh, envy you in playing King Solomon in the future, but thank you for what you've done so far. Thank you, Mr. Strayhorn. Um, all right, I think that concludes the cards. Does anyone else wish to speak on this item at this time? Please come on up and state your name. Um, wait, I, I'll get you guys next. Come on up. And if I missed your card, please let me know. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Please state your name, man. Thank you. Hi, I'm Don Hauser with Cross Country Mortgage. Um, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of the affordable housing here. I'm one of the down payment assistance experts in your county, and Lee Cares had approved me as one of their lenders. So I have a lot of experience at helping people get the down payment to get the affordable housing. I do work with Minneapolis and I was quite excited about them being able to possibly get some of the grants. And then unfortunately, I know they weren't picked and I was kind of wondering you know, how that was gonna work, but I do think the new models are needed. I think that Habitat for Humanity has done a great thing in our community, but it is time to move on to some other opportunities and people that know what they're doing in helping those people. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, come on up, sir. William, you'll be next, okay, after this. Please state your name, sir. Good morning, my name is Mike Love. I'm the uh, representative for Lee County NWACP. Um, we really appreciate the work that your staff has done they, they did an awesome job in the sim single family um, area. Uh, I think that you should immediately put a second round. The need for homes in our community is, is great and it's increasing. And you, from the, uh, from the funds you receive, Approximately 600, I think, 670 something million dollars was set aside for the housing sector. And I think we need a second round as quickly as possible. The, right now, approximately 200 and something units is gonna be built with the funds that was awarded to, um, to Habitat. There are other developers who are ready to build more units. So if it's possible, I'm asking that you have a second round so that, so that uh, more funds could be made available to, to develop more units. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, William, come on up. Yes, sir. Come on up. Willie Joe Shabell for the record. Uh, the need for all types of housing uh, is very vital. Uh, we need, uh, like I said, uh, Habitat has done uh, a remarkable, but Habitat in other countries has done rehab. You know, Habitat is a worldwide organization. Uh, the uh, tidy homes and the, the other people that are here, uh, that is, we, we need, you've got all kinds of sites that I brought up throughout the uh, years coming here. Uh, 
uh, uh, that could uh, have these tiny houses. You've got Nuna, you've got uh, Gibson Circle, you've got uh, Ortez, a lot of places that had uh, mobile homes that could, uh, vacant sites that could be utilized these tiny homes, you know? Uh, so we need people off the street. We need multiple housing in the emergency, uh, kind of the hostile setting. Uh, 89 million could uh, help a, a great deal and get the emergency housing also. That's what, you know, we don't need people dying on the streets. So uh, I'm glad to, uh, you know, uh, like I said, pay it back. You know, if we can get a little bit of money, I don't want to see people die. So I, the uh, consideration on uh, a part of that to, uh, as a continuum of care, like to uh, North Fort Myers uh, Community Center, uh, different places, so we can have housing in the different areas. Uh, the property that uh, was on this uh, list, utilizing it to uh, have affordable housing, and the profits go back into housing mainly. So uh, let's all work together. I thank you for your time. All right, at this time, anyone else wish to speak on item two? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Um, would someone like to make a motion at this time? Or comments? Mr. Chair, could, could we go ahead and dive into some of the questions that Absolutely. were raised? I mean, this is, this is a big deal. We don't, we don't do $89.5 yeah. million dollars every day. That's right. <laughs> so, we'll, um, we'll have I appreciate, discussion. appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. So let's. Um, if I may, I'll direct the questions to the county manager and then he can ask whoever he'd like to respond to him. But first, first, um, tell me a little bit about, I understand this is kind of like a first round and there is a meeting on 10-7. If you could just kind of in plain English terms explain what's, what is the October 7th meeting about? What's the goal of that? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Mr. Sire to uh, respond to that question. Yes, commissioners. The, I think Mr. Oberski's comments to the board this morning uh, really summarize what the October 7th meeting about, and that is these are extremely complicated proposals, both from a financing and a development process perspective. And so your committee has asked for another meeting where eligible applicants can make presentations, they can Q&A those applicants some more, which they did for almost four hours in the first meeting, but they need, they need more time to keep doing that. Um, and so really this October 7th meeting is for them to continue to gather uh, information, do some due diligence, and then formulate some additional recommendations for this board. And remind everybody, who's, who are they presenting to on October 7th? So the applicants would be presenting to your evaluation committee members. This is the group that you appointed to, to vet these projects and make recommendations. Gotcha. And so these will be eligible. Uh, applicants and how much money uh, is, is available? Is there enough money available to fund more projects? Yes, sir. If the awards are made here today as, as recommended by the committee, uh, you would still have roughly $110 million of multifamily awards to make. Okay. And so it's very, very likely that if you get to present on October 7th and, and your application is met with favor by the committee, uh, when do you think we would see the final decision come back before the board for those folks? I would anticipate, depending on uh, the complexity of the recommendations and any additional due diligence that has to happen, um, it would either be your second meeting in October or your first meeting in November. Okay. Um, what, you know, I guess one thing I, I was really um, impressed with was uh, the efforts at CHR on Sanibel. Um, I've seen them present many places before. Uh, certainly Sanibel was devastated by Hurricane Ian. Um, what, what, uh, will they get an opportunity to present on 10-7, as they said, and what, what uh, hurdles do they face in their application? Is there any, any guidance you can offer for a group like that? One of the reasons why I ask is because, you know, obviously we know that this is for affordable housing. It's meant for people who meet certain income limits. And, Sanibel certainly has not seen that in the past, and so um, I, I was always disappointed, and I think we testified in front of that con Congressional Field Committee that um, it seems unfair almost that the CDBGDR grants are not really able to be used in the communities that were most affected by the hurricane, you know, the, the coastal communities. And so um, I do think this may be an opportunity to use some of these CDBGDR dollars in a community that definitely suffered from the storm surge of Hurricane Ian. So do, do you have any uh, thoughts on what, 
what their path forward is or advice for them? Or? Uh, yes, sir. I would say that um, first, because it is an extraordinary opportunity to be able to develop affordable housing on a barrier island, that doesn't come along often. Uh, we did reevaluate their proposal. Um, it, you know, it's a good proposal. It, it, it didn't rank as highly as many of the other applications, but what's not considered necessarily in those rankings is this opportunity on a barrier island, right? That's something that maybe your committee can, can better weigh in on. Um, and so my guidance to them would be, they're not technically eligible to be funded under this NOFA, but this board always has the ability to award that kind of project. Okay. So, so they will make a presentation to your committee on October 7th. Okay, excellent. All right, so it sounds like there's, there's an opportunity there to look at answering that. The, the one question I also wanted to ask too, um, so we had some folks from this Oak Park development uh, testify that there may have been just a misunderstanding about their application. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, Commissioner Hammond, it, it, it could well be. Um, so just as some background, I will tell you three of the applicants whom are before you today contacted us months ago making us aware of some funding commitments that they needed to close on by December. And indeed, we accelerated the process to try to accommodate that if, if this board were inclined to award those projects. Uh, the California group the, uh, with Oak Park here that you're talking about, they flagged this at the very end of the committee meeting. We were unable to evaluate that or vet that in the moment. Uh, I know the team believed that the Florida Housing Finance Corporation letter that was included in their packet dated November 1st, 2023, required them to uh, get that funding commitment within a year's time. Uh, that may not be the case. It might be that they do have longer than that. Um, I will tell you, we've tried to confirm that with Florida Housing Finance Corporation, and as of this morning, they've not yet confirmed it. That doesn't mean it isn't true. Um, but you know, the committee really didn't have a chance to consider any of that, and I don't think it was fair to them to try to evaluate that in the moment. The other applicants provided months of forewarning, so that, that's how that came out. Would this group get a chance to present at the October 7th meeting then? Yes, sir. Path they, forward. Yeah. Yes. yes, sir, they've been inviting, invited to uh, present on October 7th. Okay, that sounds good. Um, all right, well then that, um, that seems to answer a lot of the questions that I heard in public comment, you know, and I'd love to hear from my, my colleagues. Yeah. Commissioner Lane. Sure. Um, Glenn, maybe walk us through, you selected three, um, let's see, of eight, and I'm going to assume that in capital stacking, um, year end is pretty critical for everybody. I mean, I don't know how we say it's more critical than others because just the way that you applications are put together is a variety of different entities that obviously stack the capital as was indicated and actually facilitate this. So I'm trying to understand, first of all, three said they need to close by year end. I'm sure if you asked all eight, they probably would answer the same question. You know, the tax breaks that are available are obviously year end and that's the commitment everyone's going through. So I don't understand how we pick one or the other so that's my first question. Um, how do we disseminate between three and eight, and how do five get left behind? Yes, sir. Well, uh, so the two in today's mix that are Florida Housing Finance Corporation deals have tax credit allocations that they need to, um, it, I'm gonna call it close, for lack of a better term, on that funding commitment by December. Um, the third is a Lee County Housing Finance Authority deal who indicated that for the, the bond uh, cap that, that they're using, that needs to close by December, um, or the funding commitment needs to be put in place. So that, that is how these three projects were prioritized um, by the committee. And you know, I, I certainly agree, Commissioner Ruane. I think everybody's going to say that they are shovel ready. They need to close on the financing ASAP. We don't necessarily disagree with any of that. It's just that 
you know, again, the committee felt like they needed more time and more information to better vet everybody's uh, claims about those two things. Okay. Um, what type of penalties, what type of language, what type, how do we hold people accountable? Everyone says you rent. So we allocate the money and they don't get this done. So we basically selected this company over that company with the hope that they would be done by year end. When the window passes and they don't achieve that, what recourse do we have, if any, to deny funding? Yeah, great question, Commissioner. We would suggest uh, first and foremost that if uh, these three projects that are, we were talking about don't finalize those funding commitments that the award be contingent on that and it simply expire. Secondly, they would have to commence uh, with the project and that could be defined various ways within six months of the award. And then finally, we would also recommend that they actually commence construction by a date certain or the award expires. So I think, I think at least three contingencies to your point built into the award makes sense. Yeah, I mean, my concern in general is if we pick one or two three groups and one or two do not meet the deadline, the tax credit, which is a really important part of this, you basically stack all different types of incentives to build this project, and the tax credits are really important. We're going to allocate money. They're not going to achieve the goal. You need to certainly make sure that we're going to pass on someone else. I mean, year-end is only year-end. We only have three. So I'm struggling with why we have three as opposed to eight, and I get that because it's crucial, and I think October 7th, the committee, the presentation, I don't know that they're going to be able to close for the end of the year, those other five. And that's my hesitation. What do we do with that opportunity? And the tax credits are just enormous. You know, secondarily, that jumps out at me is we have some people that we're aware of, their local builders, they provided in this community this space. We also have to have some type of clause that penalizes people for not coming in with their projects on budget. How do we do this in a world where we're going to allocate money and then they don't actually have enough money to come back to us? Because I think once you're in a project, the problem you run into is when funding dries up, you're committed to the project. It's like building a house and the contractor coming over to us and saying, I need another $50,000. You don't have it, you can't finish the project, what do you do? And that's, you know, just an area of struggling. So, you know, in the private world, you would put someone with liquidated damage to have some type of facility to penalize them. Because at the end of the day, we want to achieve the most number of housing units possible. And we want to leverage this as best we can. And that's what this is, is a leverage stacking. Capital stacking, leverage stacking, however you want to categorize it. But that's what it is. And each component is critical to that. Because we're going to allocate this. If they don't hit your end, then they lose the tax credit. Someone else might be able to take it. If we allocate X dollars and they run over budget, we're taking money from somebody else. So I would think at the very least, there's gotta be some penalties and or consequences if you don't hit your end, like you say, and if you don't stay on budget. I mean, I would think that we, we need to do that like anything else, because we don't have an opportunity to get any more money. Round two, you know, I'm sure that this board has the ability of working with our federal lobbyists to go back for that unmet need that still needs to be filled. I'm sure there's another opportunity, but that's down the future. We're just trying to deal with today. So I'm having a hard time separating the three from the eight, and I'm just trying to make sure we protect ourselves with year-end commitments that need to hit. They need to hit that date, as well as the tax commitments associated. Those are my comments. Okay. Um, all right, I have a, a comment about it as well. One of, one of the things that concerns me, and these are situations that are very to say shovel ready is kind of a cliche in a way because exactly what is shovel ready, right? So there's becomes opinions in what's shovel ready. Um, so that, that concerns me that we, we're picking only three out of a large amount of people that have, have put in. Um, so I would like to see staff also consider for that October 7th meeting is to look at the people that have done this with us. And, and there's a lot of those groups out there. And, and we want that 
that gives you a little bit of comfort that the people we're dealing with are people that we have dealt with um, and kind of know what you're getting. So I think that should be weighed in as well, not just, you know, I can start in January. Because you could start in January doesn't mean you're going to get it done any faster than someone starts in March, simply because they're more prepared. They're, 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 you know, they, they've done this in the past. So that performance also should be a part of the equation, in my opinion. Um, you know, we, we, the, so I think when we're weighing the, the, the folks that are doing this, we should also consider the ones that we've been doing it with for the, over the years and they have performed. I think that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, Mr. Hunter. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, can you make that a motion for direction to the committee? Yeah, I, I would like to make that a motion. I, I'd like to make a motion that uh, at moving forward, and, and let's see if I get this right. Um, I'd like to make a motion moving forward that we reevaluate our criteria and, and consider, uh, I don't know kind of, kind of how to word it. Uh, Glenn, can you help me on that? But, yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I, think I don't want to put too much in there to take it away, so please help me out. No, Mr. Chair, I think we understand you are looking for experienced affordable housing providers that uh, probably have experience with both state and federal funding that we've worked for before, probably uh, have done projects even in this community, and that that should be given some weight by the, uh, by the committee. Does that? Yes, exactly. Because I think that, that should be weighed in on the people we're using because we, it gives us a, a little bit of confidence in what we're, you know, we're getting people that we know we can trust, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, Commissioner Sendo. I'm going to have a comment if you're. I'm going to make that motion okay. uh, that Glenn uh, did for me. So I'll make that motion to approve under that. I'll second that. Okay. We have a second, Commissioner Wayne. Uh, Comm Commissioner Sandelli. Um, I just want to step back a little bit. Uh, I've been in, associated with the real estate industry for 40 some years. Um, learned some things and I've forgotten a lot and stuff like this. But um, I don't think there's been a bigger challenge in those 40 years than trying to solve the affordable housing issue for a variety of reasons. Um, these funds to me are kind of a godsend that we finally have some money to make these things go forward. Um, with that comes our responsibility to how we use those funds. And that responsibility goes down to a process and a process likes time. Any process is frustrating to everybody. But as was said here today, it's a very complex process. And I hope that we can appreciate the fact that nobody sprinkled us here with magic dust. We're trying to work through this process and be fair. And I want to get away from the, the construction piece for a minute. Um, I've gotten to know Habitat for Humanity uh, for some of the work that they've done. And I think that their model is one model. I'm not saying it's the all in. But I think the structure of that model um, incorporates more than buildings. It incorporates families and how families get a piece of what's going on. I, hate, I, I endorse that model. But I also do believe that there are some new models that will take us forward as, as in anything else. And I hope that we can help create a pathway you know, for those new models to be uh, looked at. But I go back to what Commissioner Wayne says, there's gotta be responsibility for those who we incorporate in that. And I think rep reputation is something that's invaluable in the process. So those are my comments. Okay. Um, just so I could clarify uh, to make sure that, so my motion would, would approve what's going on today or would it say that we're going to approve this in October 7th. Are we saying that we're going to approve this, but the new part, or moving forward, um, we will definitely look into that criteria. Is that is that where this motion is? I just want to make sure of that. Mr. Chair, if you're consolidating the action item, it would be to uh, make the awards that have been suggested by the committee, and then direct the committee to weigh the factors that you just articulated a few minutes ago. Or we can say October we 7th. can approve all this on October 7th. So, can we right? separate these? I mean, yes, that's, just, that's why I'm, I'm asking. I'm, Do we need to I'm, separate I'm, I'm, the I'm two? I'm trying to come up with, yes. I think what you would lose yes. to, Mr. Chairman, is exactly where I was going. We need to make sure that the people that apply are held accountable, but we also want to make sure that they have the true criteria and elements to fulfill the obligation we have. I mean, experience is going to really matter in this item because if you want to talk about a complicated way to build affordable housing, this is exactly it. So if you haven't done this before, I don't know that because the score is the best and you don't have any experience in Lee County, 
I have to worry that the budgeted number you submit may not be achievable, mm -hmm. and there's your issue. It may be with all the best intentions to put a bid in, but when you land the landscape here and you learn the landscape, you can't achieve that bid, so what do we do? And that's why I think your local issue is helpful because they've done this before, and I honestly don't mean any disrespect to anyone that's building affordable housing. I just don't think it's this time to basically break ground for the first time in affordable housing. I just don't. I'd like us to have a criteria to have people responsible, local, year end. If there's no, if you're not able to hit it, there's got to be ramifications. And, and I just want to make sure that what we're doing is all going to you know, benefit everyone. I'm trying to make sure that there's only three, and I, I, I'm still struggling with how we exclude and how we include. Because each one of these would say they need the tax credit. I'm sure, if you brought the other five up, they would. Uh, Ms. Shane. Yeah, it's, you know, everything that's been said so far makes a tremendous amount of sense. I mean, certainly if you're going to go ahead and invest this kind of money into your community, uh, you would want to know that you're working with proven, experienced local partners, right? That makes a ton of sense. The one question that I have to ask, just based on some experience in dealing with um, federal grants in the past, uh, is maybe it's our legal counsel who can answer, maybe it's Glenn who can answer, but uh, is would HUD, would HUD Call, give us any grief over this kind of a preference in the weighting of the scoring because I think that's something that we need to ask because I've seen other federal grants in the past where they've made us get rid of local preference and things like that and I don't know that this is necessarily local preference but it's, it's something we need to ask the question. Yes, that, no, Commissioner Hammond, I agree tremendously and that's why I'm trying to be careful here to make sure we get the wording right um, and, and exactly what we're voting on. So. Uh, Glenn, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Hammond, you raise a great question. We absolutely don't want to, this to rise to the level of some kind of local preference, as you put it. Um, however, uh, you know, we'll we'll make sure before conveying this direction, if if this motion passes, we will vet it with our HUD grant manager before conveying that direction to the committee. Um, I think the experience criteria that you're asking them to really consider are fully within the bounds of the grant shouldn't be problematic, but we would fully vet it with HUD, formulate it according to the spirit of the motion, and then convey it to the committee. And you think you could get all that done by October 7th, rather? Yes, sir. We have a uh, standing call with our grant managers uh, on Monday. Okay. So, you know, one, one thought I had then, because like I said, I think everything makes a lot of sense here about, you know, talking about adding in criteria to weight people based on experience and performance in the past of being able to deliver. Uh, the other thing I love was the, the conversation around safeguards that we include in these agreements. And I assume that these agreements have safeguards already built into them, but I don't think it's a bad idea to go ahead and make a motion today that explicitly outlines some of the safeguards, uh, Commissioner Ruane, that you are looking for, things that center around making sure that people hit the timelines, that they commence construction when they say they're going to, that they get it built by the time they say they're going to, that they do stay on the budget that they say they're going to stay on, because uh, you're right. We, we are not going to be able to bail out anybody who gets in trouble with their money in the middle of construction. You're, you're not going to come back to us in the middle and say, hey, I just need to get a couple more million dollars to finish the project. That's, that's not what we're here for. You know, we're, we're going to try and administer this grant as efficiently as possible. Um, so I, I, I think it'd be great if we, like you mentioned, take it up separately. Let's, let's do a motion that's already been on the, put on the table here just about the experience criteria and direction to our evaluation committee to add that experience criteria in. And then I'd love to hear a second motion then about the safeguards. And then third, we can take up the motion on the actual $89.5 million item then. Yep. Okay, uh, Mr. County Attorney Richard, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And following up on Commissioner Hammond's comments, I was gonna respectfully request you take action on the motion that is on the floor and has been seconded. That motion will require public comment before you go on to further business. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll, we'll take up that motion first that we made and you second, or you do you? I'm, I'm trying one. to make sure I understand because where it got a little complicated was initially you said local and then you said approve this as a whole and I want to make sure they're separate. Well, that, I agree, and that's what we're trying to say. The motion that we made, Glenn put out for us, 
would not be uh, voting on this uh, item two in front of us. It would be the motion I'm making that this would be the criteria that we would be looking for moving forward. So we would be making that motion. Um, and then we would have a second motion, if you would like a second motion, adding some of the additional things that you talked about. Safeguards. Safeguards. Um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to make sure everyone's aware and if we could restate the motion because we might need to amend or add on to that. If you might state it for us, sir. Say that sorry. again, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to hear the motion because there might need some refinement Find to it. it. Again. You right. know what? And we might need to do some amendments. <laughs> take it. All right. Mr. Chair, I'll take another crack here. I believe the motion is to direct the committee to consider an applicant's experience in delivering affordable housing product uh, in, if not Lee County, a similarly situated market. Uh, I, I hope that captures what you're looking for. Yeah, I, I, yes. I, I, I mean, I know we have to not exclusively do that. I understand that. But I think that we have to consider um, that to be a little bit of a part of it. So that I'll agree with that motion and I'll make that motion. Um, and I'll second that. And we'll second that motion, Commissioner Wayne. We have to make sure for public comment, we keep the motion separate so that people, speakers know yes. they speak on that comment only, not yes. about the process again or about their awarding. Yes. So as I ask for public comment on this, I'm going to let you know if you're hearing what we're saying, we're basically making a motion that we would like to get a little bit, dig down a little deeper on the criteria uh, for the things moving forward. Uh, so we're not voting on item two at this point. We're voting on my, our motion that we just made. Does anyone wish to speak on that motion? Seeing, oh, yep, come on up. Please state your name, sir. My name is Brian Sodre. I wanted to make a comment in regards to the safeguard comment uh, about what Thank happens you. with this community. Mr. Chairman, okay, let's let's wait add on that, the second. That, that safeguard motion is not here yet. Okay. Okay. So we'll bring that well, up. Part we'll of, up part of uh, why I'm here is I was deemed ineligible. You're suggesting that you'd like to review based on the experience for what it seems to be the multifamily sector. Does that include the single family sector? That's my comment and question. Glenn? At this point, there is no more single family allocation to, to award if, if today's motion passes. Okay. Any discussion on that? Okay. All right, I appreciate you coming. All right. Any other? You want to state your name, sir. Dan Oversky, for the record. I, I might just be curious whether or not utilizing specific types of permits rather than geographies be the mechanism by which you use to refine this in is if people have worked with South Florida, if people have worked with any of the approving agencies. That seems to be a key factor right now in water management as a limiting factor um, and very challenging on time constraints of when they're going to respond and when you're going to be able to get those approvals. Thank you. All right. Anybody else wish to speak? Come on up. State your name, please. Thank you. For the record, Erica Steiner. I'm the uh, Vice President of Community Housing and Resources, um, also a Planning Commissioner on Sanibel. I just wanted to add to our dialogue, and thank you for your comments on, on CHR. It means a lot to us. It's important. Um, we have constructed, we are a foundation, we run affordable housing programs, but we do have local experience in construction. We built um, one of our communities in 2011, and we're also rebuilding post-hurricane one of our buildings now. So although we're not a developer per se, we do have experience with local development. So thank you. Great. All right. Anyone else wants to speak? Okay. Ms. Ellis? Yes, thank you, Marcia Ellis, for the record. Um, let me just say that I think uh, you know, affordable housing is a bit of a calling 
for those developers that, that um, see this as their mission because we know that the profit margins are less. I mean, when we look around, we see, you know, luxury, market rate, multi, and single res popping up like literally mushrooms after a, a warm summer rain. So I think that um, as much as I would uh, like to assign positive intent locally, I think that the time is ripe and ready for innovation, new faces pushing into the market, bringing in new techniques so that we can speed up the process. Um, I believe that having um, infill is really important in this um, and that you know when we're doing infill, there's less of an issue with the storm water, there's less of an issue with the permitting and approvals um, because we wanna have affordable housing where people can access transportation. Okay. So um, I, respectfully disagree with putting um, more heavily weighting the local in favor of innovation and uh, at bringing fresh blood. All right, thank you. Any other comment? Please state your name. Absolutely. Oscar Paul, National Corps, a representative of the development Oak Park. Uh, when considering developer experience, I think that it's important to mention that developer experience was a scored item contained within the notice of funding availability. Um, so when you look at the tiered list of, of developments that's already been published, uh, developer experience was considered in those scores. Um, I like the idea of bringing in new faces, but beyond just the developer and owner entity, you need to look at the development team, which includes architect, civil, local consultants uh, and what work you've done uh, as far as outreach in the local community regarding your development. Again, uh, community outreach <coughs> engagement was a scored item within the NOFA uh, that's on the tiered list. Thank you. Right, thank you. Come on up. Please state your name. This is for the motion. Got to be Make sure we're on the motion. Will we do a shopping for the record? Uh, I noticed the affordable housing projects, you have eight of them. Uh, my thing is, like I've said for years, we need people off the street. We need people that have children. There's a lady that has a little baby here that I brought up here uh, that uh, is going to be living in a room because new owners took over and she's getting evicted, okay? We need housing for people and we and the developers you know the affordable housing uh eight projects uh i'd like to uh, as i talked to you mr hammond uh, about a month ago i caught you uh after a meeting and uh i purchased uh, i got some seed money from a friend of mine and i uh, noticed doing my uh, humanitarian work uh, uh we would took some food out to the community center at suncoast and there was a vacant site on heart in case right next to the community center so uh, a friend of mine purchased it I, uh, with me uh, and uh, like that developed for that community okay so uh, not to be mine but to be a part of a community same with the place on noon and some of these uh, rundown uh, sites that could have tiny homes put on or whatever uh, as a continuum of care okay Money is coming in, go back into projects that aid the community and the people in the community that serve the community, such as getting clothes for the homeless, such as uh, food banks, such as people that feed in the parks and that. So working together, we can make a better community and we can make a better world. I right, thank you for your time. Okay, any other? Jacqueline McMiller again. Um, I just learned, based on Mr. Sawyer's um, statement, that the affordable housing, the single family homes, the funding for that, will, there will be no other funding. And I think that we're doing the same thing over again, but we're expecting different results. We're not looking at other alternatives to single family homes. We've just had some representation where, um, with some of the mini homes, if that is the, we're looking at $50 million to one particular developer one particular one so if that's the case i think that that needs to be reevaluated as well all right thank you and that is not the motion that's on the floor just so everyone understands that is not what this motion is so we're not voting on item two yet all right so please go ahead sir state your name hi sean mosheim with national court 
Uh, Commissioner Wayne, just to better understand your preference to to wait more heavily on, on local uh, developers? If I may stop you, unfortunately, sure. you can't direct a, a direct question to the commissioners. He cannot answer that question under this format, okay? So you can make your comments, but he's, he's not gonna be able to direct directly back to you. Sure. Okay. I guess it's my understanding that the preference to wait more heavily on local developers is their understanding of the local construction market. I just wanted to point out that <clears throat> to undergo credit underwriting for Florida housing, you have to have a signed GC contract, which is a gross maximum price contract with the GC. And part of that rigorous underwriting, they consult with a third party consultant that, um, that conducts a, what's called a plan and cost review that goes into strenuous detail on your construction plans, your GC contract, and they make a conclusion based on their findings on whether or not you can actually build the development that you're proposing for how much you're proposing to develop it for. And the banks that are giving out these construction loans also have their own sets of underwriting standards to ensure that all of the financing and commitments that you are purporting, that, that you can accomplish it. So I just wanted to make that known. Okay. Any other comment at this time? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. We have a motion on the floor. But, but, just, just to clarify, I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation about local. I'm trying to make sure we have experience. Exactly. Um, that's the most important thing. And you might be up in Tampa, but if you have done construction and done work in the affordable housing here in Lee County, that obviously means something. I'm not trying to take away from anyone. I just want to make sure that we identify the people that have had the experience and we obviously come up with safeguards that's where we're going next mm -hmm. to make sure we we adhere to these guidelines we adhere to their contract and there's obviously repercussions if they don't that's my point okay a question mr Hamm. uh glenn could you could you highlight and, and maybe i don't know if you have it available to you right now but maybe Jeannie, somebody could um just so i heard that experience is already part of the scoring criteria could somebody explain the experience component of the scoring criteria that's already there currently? Because it may meet the spirit of what we're trying to do in this motion today. My caution with the motion today is, as we heard now in public comment, several people said the word local. I don't want to set us up for any kind of challenge in the future where people say, see, look, they switched something and made it local preference. So if we already have this experience criteria in our scoring, then I would, I would kind of be inclined to just stick with what we already have. Uh, but I'd like to hear from our staff. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chair. Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, Commissioner, yes Commissioner Hammond. Uh, experience is certainly one of the scoring criteria. Um, I guess I would only caveat that by saying, and, and Jeannie can explain everything that was evaluated as part of that if you like. Um, the only caveat to that is, um, you know, the, the scores are one of the evaluation tools. And I believe the committee has um, indicated that it does want to look at things that aren't necessarily just captured within a point value. And so whether or not our experience weighting in the scoring rubric matches what is being suggested here today, that's hard to answer. Uh, it, it was considered, I just, I, I I think the motion is to just make sure the committee is very cognizant of it and, and is emphasizing it. Okay, last question real quick, Mr. Chair, if I could direct it to our county attorney. What is the safest way for the board to express its desire to see experienced uh, partners come forward um, as, we, as we continue these evaluations? Mr. Chairman? Uh, you recognize Richard, please. I think the board's discussion uh, that is clearly on the record has clarified that your motion and second go toward a preference for ex experience, that it is not a per se local preference mandate, and I believe the record would be sufficient to safeguard the county in, in this area going forward. So the motion, as, as explained, yes, is okay to... With the record and the, the discussion that the board has had okay. to clarify its legislative intent that you're looking toward experience, not preference. Okay. Yes. Right. And, and I think the motion also is that we're not saying that that's the only, we're just asking to be, to look at it. Right. And, and, and then you get that answer. Okay. Um, any further discussion? No, I appreciate the county uh, attorney's comments because I think what we were trying to do is make sure we have that experience. Um, and, you know, I don't want geography or local or any of those words to cloud what we're trying to do here. Exactly. Uh, 
All right, thank you. Um, so I have a motion. Um, you have a second. Uh, do we have a second? second? We have a second from Commissioner Wayne. Any further discussion on that motion? Okay, seeing none, any objections? No objections, motion moves unanimously. Okay, now let's move on to, uh, do you wanna make sure. an additional motion? I was gonna say, Mr. Chair, before he jumps in, yes. if, you, if I may, I think I have an idea for us. Yeah. Uh, County Attorney, my understanding is we've already taken public comment on the staff recommended motion, correct? Yes, the item that is on the agenda. That, could that motion be amended to include his direction on safeguards then, and therefore we can go ahead and take the vote on the item once he's outlined his motion? I would suggest that of an abundance of caution if you're going to make that substantive modification to the agenda item, that you open it back up for public comment based on the oh, motion I, that I, I made. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I, I believe what the intent of what we're trying to do is have safeguards in place to adhere to the criteria we're indicating. One, there's a shovel readiness and you adhere to the closing date you're supposed to. Two, you know, if you're indicating it's your end and you're going to receive tax advances, that we have to have, you have to hit these objectives or you have to hit these criteria of year end of shovel ready of the way this is going to be stacked and I'd like just to reconfirm before we award that we review all the criteria we have and make sure that they're aware of that there's going to be a penalty and could potentially exclude you from the process if you can't prove you have year end ability if you can't prove that uh, you have shovel ready. I'm just trying to make sure the safeguards are in here um, and I think you know the two that jump out of me are year end and and the resources and shovel readiness of them. I'm just really concerned about this um, because I do believe that all eight projects that are here all need year end tax credits so I can't imagine how these three leapfrogged over the others. So I just want to make sure we have those safeguards in place. Okay. So that, that is the motion? Yes. Okay. Uh, do we have a second of that motion? Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, Mr. Harner. If we could, I, we'd like to clarify just the penalty component that we're, that's allowable. So I'd like to ask Mr. Salyer. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I guess two things. One, in terms of the three before us, those are the ones that flagged that they have invitations to underwrite that have to be, quote unquote, closed by December of this year. Um, there may be some others in the mix that have that as well. Uh, I don't know, but, but we weren't alerted of that. Um, and so we didn't vet it or verify it, but for these three we did. So that, that's how that happened. And then secondly, in terms of penalties, that is something we would have to work with the county attorney's office and HUD on. I think we can certainly make these awards contingent on all of the things that you've stated. Um, and while we do include liquidated damages clauses in all DR contracts for goods and services, I, I don't know what kind of penalties could be included in the developer agreements, except for perhaps being excluded from further consideration for this funding if they don't, if they don't perform. I appreciate the comments. Really what I wasn't looking for a penalty per se, but what I was looking to, if you didn't meet the criteria at some point during the process, that, that applicant be excluded because they didn't meet the criteria of our safeguards that we have in place. If you're advocating that you're year-end and you need the year-end tax credit and you can't achieve that, I don't know how we move forward with this financing because that's an element. If you indicate that this has to, you know, again, part of the year-end tax credit is you have to have shovel and you have to be shovel ready and or commence construction. If you don't hit that, I th I'm not looking to penalize, I'm looking to exclude those Obviously, over those examples, whether it's year end financing, whether it's you got to start construction by the end of the year, I want to make sure we hit those milestones. If you don't, I don't know how we give you and move forward with the contract. And I think there should be sufficient ground, county attorney, to exclude if you don't hit the criteria. Uh, if I could, could just ask you to clarify. Which, Mr. Chairman, as presented in your refined presentation, I would agree that the failure to perform would be an eligible criteria to bar from future performance. I, I appreciate the comments. That's what I was trying to get at. I wasn't looking for a financial penalty. I, I think really if you are eligible, you're eligible. If you don't hit the criteria, then you're not eligible anymore. It's that simple.
Okay, uh, uh, so at this point, I, I feel like we should clarify the motion, and, and I'm not gonna a, a necessarily ask uh, uh, Kevin for you to do that, but I would like you to confer with the, uh, with the county attorney to make sure that the motion that we are voting on. If you be so kind to refine, to, to state on the record my refinement of my comment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Richard. We'll take a shot, and I, I apologize for the interruption of going over and conferring with Mr. Salyer. You wanna get it right. Just wanted to confirm that it is our understanding of the board's intent by virtue of this motion that failure to perform would act as a debarment to future participation in the program. Correct. Thank you. Correct. Okay. I will second that. Future participation. Okay. Do I need to have public comment on that? Yes, sir. Okay. I will open that back up for public comment. Does anyone wish to speak on the item? Please come up and state your name, sir. Hi, <clears throat> uh, Michael Allen, again, Revital Development Group. We are uh, one of the three applicants awarded um, for year-end closing. And as I mentioned at the evaluation committee, just wanted to clarify, our preference to close by the end of the year is um, try to meet the rec re request by Florida Housing to reduce their bond carryovers to close in 2024. Um, if we don't in the carriers in 2025, we specifically don't have penalties, but it does impact them and their, their bond allocation, whereas if you don't lose them, if you don't use them, you lose them. Um, the other thing I would say is, I, I can't speak on behalf of the other two awarded applications, but I think we're, we're confident to, to close with employee transparent with county staff as well. We're holding our closing calls right, right now, which are roughly 50 participants with all the lenders, tax credit investors, our council as well, um, invited them to join our, our calls uh, if, we, if we receive formal approval here. Um, the one thing I will say by the year end closing, um, maybe have that penalty but for the requirements affiliated with the CDBG DR because there are, it's hard, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So the part 58 environmental review, for example, um, if that's not ready and that prevents us from, from closing, then we're exempt from penalties, for example, or authorization from funds. Any, anything associated that may take some, some delays that, that are coming from HUD. Um, we don't anticipate any of those as well. Uh, Florida Housing has done a, a HUD environmental review as well. Um, it was ordered through a state agency rather than federal, so we have to go through that process again, but understanding it may be expedited, so we're, we're still confident, but just wanted to make that comment on uh, potential impacts on the year-end closing for at least our specific project. Okay. Um, I had a question. <clears throat> is, it, is it possible that we could just, that we could pass the requested motion from our staff, but make it contingent upon financing, and if the financing falls through, then the board has the option to reallocate the dollars? Because I feel like that hits what you're looking for. If they don't close and they don't get their financing, then obviously it comes back to the board to have the option to reallocate the dollars, or if there's a good explanation, the board could you know, continue to move forward, but it, it honestly seems like it's a little more straightforward approach to, but I, I'm just tossing it out there to the motion maker. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, make sure we reward the people that need to be rewarded. But if there's something, I think the last speaker just brought up something that may be outside the control. I'm not looking at, I wanna make sure the developer is ready to go. Yeah. Not, and if there's an agency outside that has prevented this for whatever reason, don't know that they, the, it's beyond their control. Right. That's my point. Could, could we add just simply saying could exclude you from further project. In other words, I know there, there's going to be situations, that, as the, the last speaker said, that may be out of their control. So it's not necessarily you're just never getting another project as much as it could keep you from getting another project if, if staff deems that they didn't do their job. Does that make sense? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Richard. <clears throat> We as your staff believe it was the board's intent in the motion that was made was to recognize debarment potential for developer, con developer controlled failures. Not our first rodeo. We understand that there are circumstances that may be beyond the control of an individual applicant, meaning dealing with the federal government or another federal agency that would justify non-performance. We would take that into consideration in any recommendation we would make back to the board as a justification for that non-performance. 
as I said, we understand the board's intent to be developer controlled failures or developer controllable failures as a debarment action going forward, not circumstances beyond our control. In, in the legal world, it's called a legal impossibility. Legal impossibility is a justifiable reason for not going forward in a contractual relationship. We understand that when you're dealing with third party agencies, you may not have ultimate control over your destiny, and we as your staff would factor that into any recommendation for future action we would make to you all. Okay, you okay? Sure. Okay, um, I did close public comment, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure I'm on, on, on the right move here. Okay, uh, so we have a motion from, com from Commissioner Wayne. Uh, I second the motion, Commissioner Greenwell second. Any further discussion from the board on that? It's seeing none, uh, that motion proves unanimously. Now let's bring up item two. Um, so you've already taken public comment. We've taken you. public comment. So at this time, further discussion from the board, or would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the motion requested by uh, the administration. Second. Okay. So we have a motion to approve item number two from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Pendergrass. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, uh, item number two moves unanimously. Uh, Mr. Horner, please introduce item number three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is to approve amendment to Florida Department of Commerce loan for Hurricane Ian recovery. I'd like to ask Mr. Winton to present the item. Commissioners, last year the county received a $25 million uh, zero interest uh, loan with a two-year term uh, operating loan from the Florida Department of Commerce. Um, that was had a due date of 2025. Um, we have received an extension of that uh, repayment of that loan to um, uh, 2033. And this is the amendment that effectuates that extension. Okay, Commissioners, any questions uh, for staff at this time on item three? Okay, seeing none, I will call for public comment. Does anyone, I do not see any cards from item three. Does anyone wish to speak on item three at this time? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, Move the item. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion for approval from Commissioner Wayne, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Any further discussion from the board? Okay, seeing none, uh, any objections? No objections. Item number three moves unanimously. Uh, Mr. Harner, please introduce item number four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is to award contract for Lover's Key and Bonita Beach Nourishment. I'd like to ask Mr. Steve Boutel to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. This item awards a contract to Weeks Marine for the excavation, transportation, and placement of beach-compatible sand on multiple segments on Lover's Key and Bonita Beach to offset critical erosion as well as impacts from Hurricane Ian. Contract amount is $39,193,250. Uh, minimum of 80% of that is anticipated to be um, reimbursed. Most of that coming from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We also have FEMA funding and funding from the city of Bonita Springs to offset the cost. Uh, we anticipate that work subject to this approval uh, to begin on or around October 15th and be completed by no later than June 15th of 2025. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any questions for staff at this time? Okay, seeing none, I will open up for public comment on item number four. Does anyone wish to speak on item number four? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, does anyone wish to make a motion? I'll move the item. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Sandelli, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Uh, any further discussion from the board? Okay, seeing none, item number four, motion absolutely five to zero. Uh, Mr. Harner, please introduce item number five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is to approve a local agency program agreement with FDOT for Able Canal Linear Park Project, and I'd like to ask Mr. Young to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. Mac Young, Lee County Parks and Recreation. Uh, this item is to approve the local agency program agreement with Florida Department of Transportation in the amount of $4,362,650. This funding will be used to develop a six mile long linear park along Abel Canal and Lehigh Acres and will include shade structures, landscaping, and shared use paths for bicycles and pedestrians. 
Lee County is also contributing additional $940,773 to this project. Expected to start the end of this year and expected to end date would be fall of 2026. Okay. Any questions at this time, Commissioner for staff? Okay, seeing none, uh, I will open up for public comment on item number five. Does anyone wish to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, um, do we have a motion? Chair, I'll second your motion for approval. I'll second. Motion to approve Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Sandelli. Is that right? Um, any further discussion on this? What did I miss? Uh, it's your district, so I said I would second your motion for approval, but oh. no worries. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I got a lot of papers I, in front of me I, today, I do, folks. I, I, I do want to say that. Let's start back on that. I just want to thank yeah. staff for working on this. This is another great addition, another commitment to East Lee County. Um, I think we got the numbers recently, how much Lee County has put towards East Lee County and East Lee Hikers. It's another great project we got there. We are doing biking, exercise, recreational programs throughout the county already that's funded. So, uh, again, thank you for staff for putting this together. So. Right. Any further comments? Yep. Um, at this time, I would like to start the motion all over. Um, Commissioner Hammond, I, I will uh, uh, um, go ahead and uh, make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. Okay, you'll second. Thanks, Thanks Sorry, Mr. Sandelli. Uh, Commissioner Sandelli. Right. Uh, all right, so we have a motion to approve Commissioner Greenwell, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Any further discussion? Any objections? Item number five you moves unanimously. Mr. Harner, please introduce item number six. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a ward contract for a free open water reclamation okay. facility, deep protection well, and I'd like to ask Ms. Pam Keyes to present the item. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Pam Keyes with Lee County Utilities. Today we're asking you to award a competitively bid construction contract for our second deep injection well at the Three Oaks Water Reclamation Facility. This is a regulatory requirement from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to renew our operating permit for that facility, which is undergoing capacity improvements now. Uh, this project was included in our FY24 capital improvement program. All right, Commissioner, any, uh, commissioners, any questions no. uh, for staff at this time on item number six? No. Any comments? All right, I will ask for public uh, any anyone wish to speak on item number six at this time? Okay, I will close public comment. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion to approve. Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Wayne. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, any objections? Nope. No objections. Item number six moves unanimously. Um, Okay, um, okay, we will move then to public, com public uh, uh, committee appointments. Uh, Commissioner Hammond, do you have any uh, appointments? No appointments today, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Commissioner Pendergrass, do you have any appointments? Yes, I do have. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a reappointment of Jack Morris to the Land Development Code. Second. Uh, we have a motion to approve any, and a second uh, from Commissioner Hammond. Uh, any objections? Nope. No objections. I am used unanimously. Uh, Commissioner Sandella. We have none. Any, have none? No. Uh, Commissioner Wayne. Yes, I have a reappointment, Bruce Luerma, to the Calf Island OM. Any second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner uh, Lorraine, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Any, uh, any objections? No objections. Item moves unanimously, uh, and I have none. That concludes our committee appointments. County manager item, Mr. Harner, do you have any county manager items? I'm sorry. Commissioner Harner? Any commissioner items? Commissioner items. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, what did I miss? Any commissioner items? I have uh, one, Mr. Mr. Hammond. If I may. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to just give you all a heads up about something I want to talk about tonight at the budget hearing. I don't want to hit you with it cold at the budget hearing, though. Um, no vote is necessary this morning, though. Uh, we could take action on it at the budget hearing. But basically, I just wanted to bring your attention to the library fund. Obviously, we have an amazing library system, uh, which we celebrated the 60th anniversary of it today. The library fund has been building significant reserves now for quite some time, and it appears that there are not any projects earmarked 
for those reserves. So we have you know, quite a bit of capacity, uh, nearly $43 million uh, projected at the end of this next fiscal year in reserves. So the, the point I wanted to make is that we could actually hit the rolled back rate on the library tonight. We would still put another 8.3 million in reserves in the next fiscal year budget, and they would still continue to have a very healthy reserve of, of $43 million uh, if we do make that move. So actually, sorry, yeah, it's projected to be a, a reserve at the rolled back rate of $45.9 million. No, sorry, 43.8. I, I, I read it wrong. I apologize. The expenditures were 45.9. But either way, regardless, like I said, significant reserves in that fund. We could hit the rolled back rate, still have a surplus this year, still build reserves. And so that would be my motion when we get to the library fund in the budget hearing tonight. I'd like to make a motion that we hit the rolled back rate. So I'll give you that heads up today. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Pendergrass, do you have a any? Yes, I have a couple of quick, okay. more, more information on anything uh, for now. So uh, first of all, I want to recognize this, briefly than the list originally, uh, this past weekend I attended the Lee Hikers Veterans Park Celebration, 20th year anniversary, and we had a great program out there on Saturday. So Dave, your staff out there at is, is the Veterans Park did an amazing uh, event that day for, we had all the, all the county services out there. We had hundreds of residents show up. They had a cake and they had bands playing and everything. So, the Parks and Rec really did an amazing job out there last Saturday. So again, thank you. Another 20 years, like I said, Lee County's commitment to East Lee County. Um, but the one thing I want to talk about is real quick, I will not be attending the MPO as of right now. I'm going to be, maybe get there a little bit late, but I will I have a prior commitment that Benita Springs that morning. But um, I saw on the agenda to be a presentation for the um, trail um, coming forward. And I know we've been talking about this the last couple of years. And, I've said that in the past, I totally support it. We supported what we did this morning in Lehigh with the trails and everything, but um, this ask keeps getting stronger and stronger. I'll make sure my colleagues understand what's coming forward because um, now the latest request, we're getting, we're getting contact from people obviously asking for financial support now from Lee County for this trail in the Cerro Benia Springs. But when you look at the numbers, and I'm always looking way ahead, and the numbers, you know, they're saying so much now, 20, uh, I think they're looking for a local match from Lee County around $10 million. But that $82 million mark that they're looking to get is only for the leasing of the property. That's not for mitigation, planning, design, or build of the actual trail. The last numbers I got from MPO a year ago probably for the building of the trail was probably around $200 million. So when you get lobbied by these groups on Friday at MPO, remember that they're, they're also looking, I know Estero Benita put a couple million dollars into it, the local state funding, federal funding. That'd be great if we could get a third from the federal, great from this third from the state, but at the end of the day, there'll still be a want ask in the future. And I'm just looking forward to so the future and even the board is setting here in the many years from here from now, when we look at these tier one projects, how many of these tier one projects in our current CIP would be, obviously, would go away? Would it be Three Oaks Parkway? Would it be Lehigh's Paving? Would it be Lillerton Road? Would it be Corkscrew Road or Lico to take a roadway that would be used by hundreds of thousands of people for a recreational facility? So it's just to make sure we understand what they're asking. Because we this happens to us, it's unfortunate, but have seen it for many years, and, and it's, these projects are great, but at the end of the day, it comes back to funding. Now, when you get really deep into the conversation with them off the record, they wanted to do a, a tax. They wanted to put it out to a referendum for a tax, and we're trying to, like, in good faith here, as Mr. Hammond just brought up on the millage tonight of the library, we're trying to reduce the cost to our local taxpayer. We talk about affordable housing, you can't make affordable housing if you keep raising taxes for this stuff. So I, just, I won't be there to make any comments probably on Friday unless I get there, I may get there a bit late, may miss the presentation, but I just make sure my colleagues understand that. So it's been a long conversation and, and Mr. Sindeli, you've been involved with the project, you know what's going on, what they're asking for, but unfortunately you won't be here in a few months and uh, we have to, fill in the new people and make sure those long time commitments like the tier one projects that we are to have funding for those. That was my one thing. Next thing I was wanted to ask about or talk about is, I don't know if you all get the same emails we're getting, um, getting a lot of people asking from Boca Grande about what's going on parking. I got some communications this week where saying that they thought we were voting on something next month for Boca Grande. So I asked the county manager yesterday, are we voting on something for Boca Grande? So we can't talk about it unless we're here. So I'm asking now if anybody, if we have information, I got the, County manager response saying we're not making any, there's no plan on place to come forward next month. And I was wondering, I know Commissioner Wayne, you've been involved, and I'm looking for your leadership to tell me or tell us or let us know what's going on. So when you get asked what's going on, because I don't know. And there, there was, I got some communication with people saying we're implementing downtown parking next month, we're doing this, this, this on 
we know how the disaster it was for the city of Marshall downtown parking when it comes to meters, and we're not looking to raise fees and taxes, so I'm just trying to find out where we are with that. So I'm going to have some open dialogue with that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lane. Sure. So uh, April 29th, 2022, as well as June 4th, 2024, uh, this board unanimously approved my ability to work with staff to come up with a structured parking program. Um, this has been an ongoing situation in 2022. Obviously, um, we delayed any type of action as a result of Hurricane Ian. A lot of time went by and associated with that. But in the meantime, you know, it's been a couple of years working with the parking committee, working with a lot of different groups and facets on the island. Um, I have a folder um, full of folks that ran. I've probably been out there 30 times. Um, I've only governed on the Barrier Islands. That's why I asked this community, obviously the commissioners, to potentially put together um, some language to do that. There's going to be continuing pressure um, the clinic that actually served um, Boca Grande went through and put a $23 million renovation that they're paying for on their own to offer medical care in Boca Grande. They're having some issues with some parking. So there's more of a need for structured parking than ever before. And with that, we have a balance and we have the community come in and weigh in on what parking, what parking restrictions you can have. Two different legal firms came in and gave us opinions. Um, we also need to balance between our strength, and I want to make sure we do that. But we do need a structured parking, and it's certainly been my intent. I've certainly worked with staff and tried to be very sensitive to the fact that, obviously, the first go-around, it was Ian at the latest. The second go-around, I was asked, obviously, in June to do this, and we were waiting for FEMA and trying to have FEMA done. I was also asked that let the budget be done. So it is my intent to move with staff. And I believe the direction this board gave me is the ability to bring back some type of draft so we can have the conversation and open up. But that was really the intent of the motion. So that's where I'm at. And this just hasn't been the same urgency as a FEMA or a budget. Right. So I haven't put it foot forward. But there's now becoming more and more of a problem. And what was just brought to my attention is that the Boca community will be going to the PECs because they're trying to put through a $23 million uh, renovation to their clinic and how being denied this parking. So if there's ever a time for structured parking, and again, I do structured parking in Santa Barbara. In the 18 years I'm doing this, I've only governed in coastal communities. So I'm very familiar with this issue. I'm trying to come up with a comprehensive way. We also had, um, right after June, a scheduled meeting with the business community. Unfortunately, my father-in-law passed away, so I couldn't attend. Um, Brent Cross from the Gasparilla Inn. And, and others are putting together that meeting with Pamela. We'll certainly have that probably in the next week or so. And you know, from there, my intent is to bring something back to the board, but I was trying to get through budget, and I really wasn't trying to do anything at this week's No, so, so my intent was not, it wasn't questioning what you did. Yeah, no, no, I'm yeah, just, I'm just you don't know. That's why I asked the county manager what, where we at with it or so, because I wasn't aware of what was going on. And, you know, I've heard rumors of the, the hex. I don't know if we even talk about the hex thing because I know they're asking for they're saying they don't need additional parking. So um, just trying to find out. And of course, the community is asking us, you know, and like you said, the priority is a priority for all of us. But it's also, like you said, there's other priorities. When you got there, the, I think the priority, I think we stressed out last year with the sheriff's department is the parking for the private residences on the access for the block drive with the block and that can be dealt with today and that should be dealt with today. I think that was our message to the sheriff's department. Enforcement is in place now. So we don't want people's residences being trespassed. We want the driveways being blocked. That needs to be fixed day one. I think we I think your office and I think all of us have passed that message on the sheriff's department. So my thing is just trying to make sure to get an update and making sure that we weren't making drastic changes yet or where we are with that yet. So I know a lot of the residents have asked out there about, since we always hold our public meetings here on Tuesday mornings at 930, about doing a public meeting out there. And I just want to throw out there to my colleagues, what do you guys think about having a public meeting in Boca Grande in November, after, maybe after the election? Don't want to not invite you to the party, Commissioner Sandelli, but it's like, um, if we do it before the elections or within, you'd be there, then you wouldn't be there the day after or do it the first week of December. The so, we can, right the so I think there'd be an opportunity for us to hear from the residents too, or do it later in the year. That'd be an opportunity. You'll be, based upon the current rotation, Commissioner Wayne, you'll be hopefully chairman after November, and then you're the district commissioner, so you'd be able to lead that meeting and help us 
put some of their issues out there to bed so we can, um, you know, not people keep asking what's going on or what are we doing about the parking uh, um, stone out there for maybe once to think about having a meeting out there or you just want to leave it as it is for now and continue working like you said it's a plan in place you're working with staff then continue doing that um, until now I didn't know what the plan was so that's what I was asking my intent certainly was to take this on in 22 and since it's been two years I certainly would like to put together what I uh, had permission from the board to put together some elements so I could bring them back to the board. We could at least look at that and have a discussion. As you had indicated, we can't talk about this, but that was my right. intent to certainly move forward with that. Um, I've met with each part of the community and the last piece of the community. Um, I know the churches have weighed in. We certainly understand. I think we have a solution for them. The business community is the last part of the community to do so. So my intent is certainly to go forward with what you allowed me to do is put together uh, with staff, you know, some pointers that we all can consider. That was really my intent. Okay, so no motion required. Well, I was just wondering if anybody else wants to want to have a quick meeting out there or you want to just wait and let it go as it is now. It's up to, it's up to you guys. That's why it's just thrown out there. It gets a consensus or not. If there's no consensus for that, then we'll leave it like this. So. Okay. I, I personally feel like that uh, we've been given the opportunity and, and given uh, some more time to bring it in front of us would, would make sense. Um, so that's where I'm at. Okay, that's fine. And then, like I said, then we'll have something to talk about because right now there's nothing that we can go have a public meeting with your public input without any plan. I think it's better to have a plan in place. That would be great to have that. So we all updated where we are with this because um, I kind of forgot what we did two years ago as far as the direction goes but to a certain point. But it's just uh, make sure we're preserving the historical area out there with Boca Grande and, you know, and make sure we don't leave everything legally too when it comes to parking. We had some, the county had very, provided some variances to some of the churches on Gilcrest in the past well basically we took that parking access away from those churches that would be a Bert Harris claim against the county then because we had granted them access to park on Gilcrest and I know it's always been a contingency thing out there and it comes up every four years um, but when we allow churches to use the Gilcrest medium for parking historically uh, and we also done that based upon a land use decision we cannot take that away so making sure that we Go through that process i'm confident staff will make sure provide that guidance to everybody and we'll come out the rest of the book grant will have a preserve their environment out there and have great structured parking any further comments i mean just to just to reiterate i appreciate commissioner kind of comments you know having dealt with beach renourish and on sanibel having dealt with issues very germane to this underwear understand of it and quite frankly i spent hundreds of hours on this particular topic I'd like to try to at least deliver something. If we all don't like it, that's certainly your prerogative. But I think it's been two years. I think it's something we need to do. And I'm not trying to do something, but the other issue that is certainly here, and as public servants, I think we want to allow the opportunity for a clinic to be able to serve the community that has done so for a number of years. If we all recall, they were very, very efficient in administrating the vaccine, which enabled all the local residents to continue to have vaccination there. So I'm just trying to balance beach renourishment. I'm trying to understand what Perth Harris is. I'm trying, I've done all these things before. I just, as the board has given me enough confidence and responsibility, I'd like to bring back something to you all and we can have a conversation. That's really all I'm trying to do. And I'll do that next month just as an outline so we all understand what the basis is. Like. No time to this, I guess I'm just trying to get an update. That's all. That's all. No, no, and I appreciate the comments. I really do, but uh, I'd like to finish the task. Okay, we got it. All right. Um, so that completes. Yes, I'm okay. done. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped a page here, so I'm going a little bit backwards here. But uh, Commissioner Wayne, do you have any? No, I, I mean, I appreciate Commissioner Pendergrass's comments on, on Bert. You know, I've been certainly approached by a couple of people. And, you know, I think it's important for us to remember when we were approached, this is going to be a creative financing package. Um, when we put together our capital improvement, we didn't anticipate to put in five, 10, $20 million. And as we all know, this past year, uh, we operated a deficit. We needed to use reserves to obviously fund the budget. You know, so it's hard for a group to go from, I think our initial investment was $5,000 for some planning. And now we're potentially looking at 15 or $20 million and no one has that type of funding. I think Commissioner Pendergrass brought that up. It's just interesting. I think people need to understand it's not that we're not supportive. It's just that in the budget restrictions we have, we don't have those extra, that extra capacity to come up with $20 million. As it is, 
you know, Pete Renton has indicated that $25 million that we borrowed, you know, got extended to 33 because cash flow is tight. You know, so I, I appreciate the comments, you know, to say the least, um, from Commissioner Pentegrass, and I think it's important he brought that up. We don't have the conversation. I brought this up because it was initially pitched to me that we would need $5,000 to do the plan. I was told this would be stacked and not necessarily any type of local match in the magnitude that's on, in front of us. And I'll, I'll concur with Commissioner Wayne. I asked the same questions. Um, my son lives in Colorado. I've rid the trails, rode the trails up in North Florida. I try to ride as much as I can. I was very specific about the pathway and the cost. And as Commissioner Wayne said, it was not something that was in the forecast well, for us. If you go back long term, long going back years ago, that whole trail, the use of some of Gulf railway access, was also just for dual transportation. Right. So either rail and recreational, right. not just recreational. But like I said, at the end of the day, the cost is not just the initial 82, then to $82 million lease. It was the uh, mitigation, developing, design, maintenance, right. and build of it. You're looking over $200 million. Yeah. You know, it was only one form of transportation, which would be bike or foot. Um, so and, uh, I think the county staff has been, I think you'll be attending the meeting on Friday too, right? MPO? MPO, That's correct. You, you'll be there. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, it, they're, their method is, and I'm, I don't want to be bare, but I know they want us to put it on the ballot for like they did in Sarasota to do a um, voter referendum. Again, trying to lower the taxes, but you're trying to raise, they're trying to raise taxes for personal recreation. So that's the, that's where we're at with that. So, Commission, Commission. you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just put this out there. Um, if they really are intent on getting something on the ballot for a voter referendum, you can do that by petition. Mm -hmm. too. It doesn't have to be brought forward by the commissioners. And I realize it's a lot of petitions to get, However, that would then be a sign that you would have the community support to get it passed. So I would encourage people to go through that position or petition process because it's a good one, you know? So um, that's just my comment on that. Right. Um, I do have one other item, sir. Yes, sir. I just want to make sure everyone, so at the last meeting we talked about Lee Health. Um, we obviously met staff and, and with Lee Health and we asked them to try to um, simplify things and talk about things in a brief uh, bullet point. Uh, we received a response from both Michael and Ben, our CFO, uh, which I distributed. I'm going to continue to make sure we have as much information as we can, um, continue to go through the finances to make sure we understand what we're getting into, and, and more importantly, so the public understands what our role is in this, because I think it's important to understand that we're a mechanism to allow Medicare to continue to be funded. Um, but I'm just trying to do whatever due diligence we can. I wanted to make sure that you all got it. And I'm, my intent is to continue to go through and distribute it, obviously, um, accordingly as we have the information. I want to make sure anything I get from the health, they copy all five of you are. So there's no communication lapses. That's it. All right. Um, Thank you, sir. Commissioner Sandelli, any, any other? No, sir. Okay, I have none. So that concludes uh, Commissioner item. Um, and now I'm going to back up again because I also uh, a public hearing agenda. There are no public hearings on this agenda. Now I'll move to walk-ons and carryovers, and there are no walk-ons or carryovers. And now I believe we can move forward and catch back up. So I apologize for flipping the wrong page. Um, so now we are at county manager items. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to ask the board to authorize a special board meeting for October 8th regarding the Lee Health Conversion Agreement. So moved. I'll second. Just point of discussion. Are we having one on the 1st, the 8th, and the 15th? We will have a regular board meeting on the 1st, the 15th, okay. special on the 8th. I want to make sure it's still in this uh, room. Is strictly for Lee Health that day? Correct. Time? 9 30. 9 30, okay. These chambers. These chambers. Okay. So that's my motion. Okay, I second that motion. Um, <coughs> any further discussion on that? Okay, no further discussion. Um, any public comment on that? Do I take public comment on that? Yes. Any public comment on that hearing for October the 8th? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Um, so do we, um, we have a motion uh, from Commissioner Hammond, a second Commissioner Greenwell. Uh, any further discussion on that? Uh, any objections? No objections? Okay, so the hearing is set uh, unanimously. Okay, now we will move on to county attorney items. Nothing further this morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, all right, the last thing on the agenda is uh, public matters uh, by citizens. I do have cards, so I will call you up. Uh, I will go ahead and tell you uh, before we get started, please address the board as the board and you get three minutes. When the light turns yellow, you have one minute. Please uh, finish up your comments. We'll start off with Rosemary uh, Tri Trito. Trito. Okay. Taking this up for me. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Trito, and I have been a resident and taxpayer in Lee County for 58 years. LC LCDAS is a disgrace to this county and has been for years. I would have thought by now. 2024, things would have changed down there, but they've got only gotten worse. Mark Mora, who oversees LCDS, has yet to do nothing. Mark Greenwell, on your ad on TV, you say TV, you're- Excuse me, ma'am. I'm going I'm to go ahead and stop you there. You can address the board. Please don't inter direct any of us individually or any okay. of the staff. Oh, excuse you can refer me. to staff okay. and you can refer- Okay, okay. so okay. All, you, all you men up here that can do something and step up, none of you have done anything to help down there. Okay, it's a mess. Um, I'm going to say that Pablo, I am going to mention his name, who has no qualifications to run that place. Can you show me a degree? Can you show me experience? Can you show me anything that says that he can be in the position he's in? No. He, he needs to be fired. He had, there's no organization down there. He doesn't care, and it trickles down to all his employees, his staff in there. I have just um, fostered two, a mother dog and a puppy two months uh, in July, and the puppy, when I got the puppy, his paws were so swollen because they were soaked in pee because they don't clean the cages out, and, and they were stained in pee. They were so soaked and so swollen. And this is what they threw up when I got him home. This is only part of what they threw up when I got him home. It's plastic. I called up there. You know what? They didn't care. Oh, I'll speak to the kennel manager and call you back. Well, you know what? I never got a call back. I took them to the vets, both of them, to have x-rays to make sure that they weren't, there was no blockage. This girl right here in 20, 2004, they want to euthanize her. I had a fight to adopt this girl. She was 10 months old. This 13 and a half year old in this picture. I had to put her down. Not too long ago, about three years ago, I put her down. Well, I got her in 2004, so. Uh, but she was 13 and a half years old. I fought to, to get her. That's how long ago I've been fighting LCDAS. They rather put them down and euthanize them than adopt them out. See, everybody want to see her picture? This is a picture. Again, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, address the board. Well, I'm sorry. Comments, not, excuse me. Well, because you guys don't want to do anything. You just don't want to do anything. Please address the board, well, not, not the audience. Thank we've you. been, look, I've been fighting this for a lot of years. My next step is to go to Tallahassee. I have a big mouth, and believe me, I'm going to use it. If you don't want to do anything, have you been there when they euthanized those dogs? You know we're the highest Thank in you, Florida? Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Your time is up. Thank you. Well, we're the highest in Florida. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because you don't want to hear Have it. You know it's day. the Thank truth. Thank you. Up next is Kathleen DeCorta. It's a problem. I wish you'd please do something. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I know um, you since you were this big. We go ahead and ask her to move back. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kathleen DeCourt, and I stand before you today with a heavy heart and a resolute spirit. I volunteered at Lee County Domestic Animal Services, a role I cherished deeply. I began my journey in June, driven to make a difference at the shelter. However, on September 10th, my services were abruptly terminated. I was terminated. The reason I was given was that my services were no longer needed. But the truth runs deeper. I was not dismissed because of any neglect or any wrongdoing on my part. I was always present, I was always dedicated and always committed to the well-being of the dogs. I was fired because I dared to speak up about the conditions at the shelter. 
I met with management at the shelter to address the deplorable conditions the dogs were living in. I took my concerns with a group of dedicated animal activists to the county manager and even spoke with one of our county commissioners, Mr. Kevin Ruane. Members of our group also met with Mr. Greenwell after that. I fully believe my termination was an act of retaliation and whistleblowing. During my time at the shelter, I witnessed dogs living, laying, and eating in their own excrement. On the very day I was fired, I was taking out Daniel, a lab mix whose cover, kennel was covered in filth. Dogs are not let outside nearly frequent, frequent enough and are left to relieve themselves and sit in their kennels, sometimes 24 and I have witnessed 48 hours at a time. Forcing these dogs to sit in their waste. While volunteering my time there, I have seen shelter employees walk and take out their personal dogs while dogs on the adoption floor remain inside in those very conditions. Volunteers are the primary care, caregivers of those dogs on the adoption floor. If it was not for the volunteers, these dogs would not get outside. Dogs deemed not adoptable, stray hold, and designated as rescue only rarely, if ever, get outside. These conditions create stress on the dogs, making them harder to adopt and causing behavioral issues, increasing the likelihood of them being killed. Also, on the day I was terminated, the most loyal, fierce, and talented volunteer at LCDS, LCDAS was also dismissed, leaving the shelter extremely short-staffed. They are in dire need of volunteers, yet people who are willing to dedicate their time and effort are being turned away. Potential volunteers and rescuers are being refused by the shelter because they do not like what they say about its condi conditions, effectively punishing the dogs in the process. I know many devoted individuals who are eager to help but denied the opportunity because of their concerns. I stand here today not just for myself but for the voiceless dogs who suffer in silence. I urge you to look into these matters, to hold those in charge accountable, and to in sure that the welfare of these animals are investigated. They deserve better, and so do the volunteers who strive to make a difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle Middleton is next. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Michelle Middleton. I'm standing before you today telling you Lee County Domestic Animal Services needs an overhaul. I know this because I'm a former volunteer that witnessed many disturbing things. I met with shelter management with my concerns and it fell on deaf ears. So I met with Dave Harner, Mark Mora, Kevin Ruane, and Mike Greenwell. I was promptly fired for doing so. The incompetence and mismanagement I've witnessed there is wrong and unfair to the staff, the volunteers, the taxpayers funding the shelter, and to the animals losing their lives. Mark Morris said in the news segment that aired last night on Fox News, not everything they do, there's a written policy. It's just basic common sense. I'm sorry, but successful shelters, businesses, and companies do not rely on management's common sense or lack thereof. The shelter staff has instructed us not to tell the public, or the shelter staff has instructed us to tell the public they only euthanize aggressive dogs. This is not true. They tried to force us volunteers to sign a very far-reaching social media policy that included limiting speech even in our private text messages. Many of us felt it was in violation of our First Amendment rights. <clears throat> I have many examples, but limited time. Quick example about a dog named Bruce. After watching Bruce suffer for almost four months on the adoption floor with medical issues, the clinic decided to euthanize him due to his extreme allergy issues. They said he'd be a financial burden and management said they'd be doing him a favor by putting him out of his misery. I fought to save him and convinced them to allow me to adopt. My vet discovered he didn't have any allergies. He had a bacterial skin infection that easily cleared up on two weeks of amoxicillin, which is a very inexpensive treatment. His ear infections were being improperly treated and he wasn't given heartworm prevention for three months. I have all his medical records to prove this. I had staff and volunteers crying and thanking me for saving him. Why would you put your staff through this gross negligence and incompetence? I have many of these stories. I'm not telling the news or the public this to keep them away from the shelter. I beg the community to go adopt and volunteer. Pablo told me my services were no longer needed there, but 
One volunteer signed up to take care of 47 dogs today. This isn't fair to the staff, to the volunteers, to the animals in their care. Management paints a pretty picture, but don't fall for it. We're in desperate need of a compassionate and competent shelter management. Changes need to be made for the great staff members, the volunteers, the taxpayers, and all the animals that deserve better. I know a couple of you have met with us privately. We hope the other commissioners will follow our lead. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, uh, Miranda Wyatt. Okay, so I have a question real quick. So you said I can't address, what does that mean? Like I can't say names? You can say names, but directing comments directly at them. You, okay. if, if you met with someone, you can say their name. Understood. But what we're saying is, that, you know, yeah, we're just okay. trying not to be confrontational. Perfect. Right? So. Okay. <clears throat> Unlike some of these new hopefuls here that speak on behalf of the half of the dogs, trying the nicey nicey way, I've been here a long time now. Me and Melissa York, you know her, right? We're the only reason this county's been turned upside down by exposing their extreme high murder numbers. See, we already know that this is all a big waste of time and useless to be here because you're all straight up liars. We've met with many of you for four years, for nothing. Y'all have these big titles and come in here on your big bad stage, but have, I have a question. When's the last time any of you been to that slaughterhouse unannounced? Pendergrass used to go there back when we were having all these useless meetings. You'd use a dog for your government Facebook page photo op, and now you're promoting puppy mill dogs? What the frick? You told us all about your family dogs and how much you love them. So will you be rescuing going forward or buying from the puppy mills that you do the photo ops with now? And then the mayor, I had reached out. I'm the one who posted on your phone number on the urgent page and flooded your office with hundreds of calls and emails a day because Lee County wouldn't answer their phones. And Roger and Mark and Morrill and Pendergrass jacked us around lying and promising they'd look into things that we brought Again, to their attention. I'm going to stop you right there. You're, you're directly attacking. You can okay, address I, the board. I won't do it again. Okay. Things that we brought to their attention and they never got back to us, which we knew. Trust me, we weren't holding our breath. So we went to you because the county deserves someone to, to ask about dog statuses, but instead you called me on Maselli asking me to take your number down, but I didn't though, because why would I? Nobody helps anyone around here, right? So I just wanted to know the, who you didn't help. Mr. Ruane, you probably know of me because we had a meeting set up a couple years ago. We heard you might care because someone, uh, to look into some of this because the good old boys wouldn't. But surprise, the meeting was canceled. What's up, Mr. Mark Mora? You know it's real good. Again, ma'am, you're doing it again. You're just directly we attacking the board him. instead of just making okay. your comments about the issues in front of you. Okay. Instead, you're attacking. But we had so many meetings with him. Okay. okay. Mr. Mora, isn't it your job to oversee the slaughterhouse? Because it is. Remember a meeting in February 22? I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. I've, I've asked you three times. You're directly We're, attacking an individual, and I said we weren't going to do that. You, and as soon as I said that, you named the person again. Just bring up the issues that you have and try to exclude the names. Okay. How, okay? Is that fair? Yeah. That's, and I'm I will give you more time because it. I know I cut you off. So make I sure want, that I give her more time. Okay, okay please, please give ahead. me more time because I really, this is so important. We had a meeting in 2022 and he asked us, now when you say rescue partner, do you mean your partners? And me and Melissa said, no, your partners. Then the county manager at the time, asked us, now when you say rescue pool, what does that mean? Like, you don't even know the basic daily operations or terminology of the facility. Volunteers being fired after being assured by two of you that there'd be, if they met with you, but they're still, they, but they're still here. They, they're new here. They had hope. We knew better, so we tried to warn them about the gag order, but they trusted you and they were fired instantly. What are you gonna do about that? Most of your panel up here, I mean, you know, you've been here a long time. After you're gone and your legacy will be of no substance, just greed. It meant nothing because you brought nothing to the table of this county of anything that actually mattered, like live souls. You're all just a disgrace, so just keep on doing nothing that matters. Thank you, ma'am. Joyce uh, Campana is next. Share that with you. 
commissioners. And this is for the record. My comments. Good morning. Um, my name is Joyce Campana. I'm a resident of District 2. And I was here at the last meeting uh, asking for a proposed amendment for supporting Amendment 3, uh, pardon me, a resolution supporting Amendment 3 to the Florida Constitution concerning adult personal use of marijuana. Well, some circumstances have changed since then, and I would like to read a proposal to you, and I've given a copy to the county manager to provide to you and to staff for a record. Whereas the county, the Board of County Commissioners of Lee County, Florida Board, has been made aware of Amendment 3, a proposed amendment to the Florida Constitution that is scheduled to appear on the November 5, 2024 ballot. And whereas Amendment 3, titled an adult personal use of marijuana, would amend the Florida Constitution. And whereas the proposed amendment allows adults 21 years or older to possess, purchase, or use marijuana products and marijuana accessories for non-medical personal consumption by smoking, ingesting, or otherwise allows medical marijuana treatment centers and other state licensed entities to acquire, cultivate, process, manufacture, sell, and distribute such products and accessories. Applies to Florida law, does not change or, Im or immunize violations of federal law, establishes possession of, let me try this again, establishes possession limits for personal use and allows consistent legislation and defines terms. Whereas the Florida Division of Elections estimates an increase in state taxes annually ranging from 195.6 million to 451 million, not including possible enactment of an excise tax. Whereas the Florida Division of Elections estimates 1.56 million represents the lowest suggested level deemed reliable among six scenarios that they looked at. It is possible that future changes, if any, to the tax structure would equal or increase the estimated level. Whereas the proposed amendment will create more good paying jobs in Florida and allow law enforcement to direct their efforts toward more serious crimes. Whereas both the Republican and Democratic candidates for President of the United States support passage of the Amendment 3. Whereas 15 Florida cities and counties have decriminalized possession and Amendment 3 has been endorsed by Republican State Senator Joe Gutierrez and former Republican State Senator Brady's attorney John Bush and Sheriff Morris Young. Whereas the board believes the passage of Amendment 3 would be beneficial to the citizens of Lee County and the state of Florida in the form of revenues, tourism dollars, you, and the health. Oh, thank you, and I've given copies to staff. All right, thank you. Uh, Kathleen DeCorta, or DeCarta? Um, did I pronounce that right? No, I already went. Okay, I didn't have, all right, I just, I kept the card in my hand, I apologize. Uh, Marsha Ellis. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcia Ellis, for the record. So first of all, I wanted to speak about the idea of uh, defunding or uh, the library. I, I am in full support of keeping uh, the funding structure for the library uh, because I think that um, there are a couple of important functions that um, it provides to the county. Um, and I think that there's opportunity to expand on the early childhood programs that are there. Um, it's really important that we um, continue whatever funds are available, that those can be utilized for the benefit of the community to provide children's services. Uh, we know that right now it's one in 36 children who are born or suffering from autism. There are lots of early childhood programs that are offered through the library that could be used as screening. The library also provides civic commons. There aren't a lot of places, particularly we have a lot of, of community development districts that are unique to Lee County. The public library represents a place that people can come together 
together and um, conduct public meetings. And I think that that can be continued to expand upon and that would be a great investment of the $43 million that are in that fund. We need more meeting places for the many um, organizations, nonprofits that are, uh, that are open to the public that people can get to after hours, after work, and play a role in um, our community. I also want to speak a little bit to the safeguard on the affordable housing because I did have some additional comment I did not need to, did not get to. First of all, let me say that the reason that we have this historic investment in our community is not because we have a lot of awesome affordable development or develop, developers in our community, all right? We were given those funds not because they recognize greatness in this community or that they recognize that we were standing out among the state or the country for providing affordable housing to this community. We were given that money because we experienced a devastating um, uh, a disaster, a hurricane of epic proportions. And because of the unique geographic, hydrologic, meteorological phenomena that occurs here, I think you're creating an undue burden on the developers that are coming forward to help us out of this mess. By trying to make them responsible for things that they're not responsible for, and it's creating an extra burden on them. For instance, look at the amount of dewatering that has to take place on a construction site whenever you're experiencing rains like we have now. Think of the supply chain interruptions. So I don't agree with that safeguard because I think it adds extra burden on this, these folks that are stepping forward to help us out of this mess. And I just wanted to make sure that those <clears throat> folks um, aren't having more heaped on them. This is an epic challenge. Thank you. Okay, uh, Linda Shelmer, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce the last name, uh, but I'd like you to come up and correct me. Uh, I, I really can't read the last part, unfortunately, I'm sorry. So please state your name. Good morning, uh, Linda Shelmer, Clem. Um, so we came, back on August 27 to see um, a, a commissioner, um, Commissioner Ruane, um, with confidence and incompetence to discuss some serious issues with LCDS's welfare, the animals of the animals at LCDS. The response initially was to inform the director of our coming, effectively starting the ball rolling in regards to the termination of two amazing volunteers at the facility. We then met with Mr. Greenwell and Mark Mora in true, and, and when it seems in true good old boy form, you came in behind and you cinched the deal. You both faced lied to a group of very concerned women that you would not retali tol tolerate retaliation. Quote, unquote, retaliation will not be tolerated. It will not happen. Well, guess what? It did. And you all, I'm sure, are aware, and you all won't even acknowledge the occurrence. I'm ashamed of our county, and I'm ashamed of all of you. And we continue at this day to have huge concerns for the welfare of animals at LCDS. Just this past Friday, a Pomeranian was picked up by a rescue in absolute acute respiratory distress. His tongue was blue and he was struggling to breathe. He required immediate emergency care. This was directly from our facility. Two other small terriers were removed and picked up from there, loaded with fleas, suffering from severe skin disorders, and also had pneumonia, all of them. They couldn't even wash these dogs and help them be comfortable. Could they trim their toenails? Dell, a young chihuahua, came in with a compound fracture of his femur. They left him in a cage without any effective treatment for that wound until he was picked up by a rescue. A French bulldog recently left, was unable to swallow food at all, it required immediate surgery for an obstruction that was overlooked and not seen by the veterinarians and the staff over at that office. Doug, a beautiful little dog that came in there, heartworm positive, was not being treated by the American Heartworm Association guidelines, in fact, not treated at all. They finally gave him a medication which effectively, possibly caused him toxicity. He suffered immeasurably. They essentially killed this poor baby before they killed him. He ended up euthanized. This needs to stop. The rescue should not be rescuing animals from our facility. You guys need to do your job. Um, it, it's really needed and necessary. Thank you. All right. Anyone else wish to speak at this time? I have no additional cards. 
anyone wish to speak at this time? Okay, I will close public comment. Um, all right, there, there is not a workshop this afternoon, uh, but there is a 5.05 p.m. final budget uh, public hearing today. So if there's no further business in front of us, I, we are adjourned. adjourned. Thank you.